Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is James Siva. I have the immense honor of being the chairman of CNIGA. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today uh, for this very uh, important and informative event, the Tribal Leaders 101. Um, we have a wide breadth of knowledge on uh, tribal sovereignty, uh, tribal law, history of gaming in California. Um, so it's my bench pl uh, pleasure to kind of introduce everyone. We have uh, Denise Turner Walsh, the Attorney General from uh, Rincon. We have uh, George Foreman, lead associate from Foreman and Associates. We have uh, Scott Crowell, and I'm forgetting your law firm, Scott, I'm so sorry. Crowell Law, that's it. And then uh, Glenn Feldman, and Glenn is with Procopia, Procopio. Um, again, I just wanna thank everyone for coming. Um, oh, uh, side note, if you have need an agenda for today, they're available in the back table. Um, and uh, talking about sovereignty, sovereignty is, is everything for us. Uh, all the tribal leaders here in this room know that. That is what separates us from other groups. That that's what makes us who we are. So having a, a basic understanding of sovereignty I think is important. Um, I hope we have some new leaders in the room because that was kind of who we're aiming this uh, for, but also established leaders, you can always keep learning. I know myself, I always want to learn more and more. Um, I know we have some uh, elected officials here. I see a assembly member, or a state senator, I'm so sorry, uh, Rosalisa Achoa Bogue here. Thank you for coming, we appreciate that. Um, with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to people who are much brighter than I am. So thank you everyone for joining and hopefully this is very informative for you. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Denise Turner Walsh. Um, I'm the Attorney General for the Rincon Band of Liseno Indians in Valley Center, California. And um, I'm gonna start off the panel just talking about some general concepts of um, uh, tribal sovereignty and how it is um, construed and described in the body of federal Indian law. Um, let me see if I know how to work this machine. Um, as Chairman Seba said, uh, I'm with Glenn Feldman, who's going to talk a little bit about PL280 and uh, a bunch of the gaming history in California, along with George Foreman and Scott Crowell. These, these, I feel like I'm with the god, the godfathers of. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Indian gaming in California today. So it's a, it's a real honor for me to be here with these um, esteemed lawyers. Um, so I want to begin with what are the attributes of tribal sovereignty? Um, and I'm going to talk about that and a little bit about how the three branches of the United States government um, basically shape the contours of tribal sovereignty, um, both the uh, uh, executive branch, the judicial branch, and Congress, of course. And then I'm gonna move into um, California Indian country because that's the focus of today's talk. Um, and use the Rincon Band of Liseño Indians' uh, exercise of tribal sovereignty through its programs and services to show you how tribes express tribal sovereignty day to day operating their governments. And then I'm going to end with how tribal sovereignty operates not just in a governmental capacity, but tribal sovereignty is very important to Indian tribes in a commercial capacity and in the gaming space in particular, before we segue to um, Glenn Feldman, who's gonna talk about um, more of how we got gaming. Uh, so beginning with uh, some foundational concepts in federal Indian law. The first is that tribes are sovereign entities that exercise an inherent right to self-government. As sovereigns, tribes cannot be sued without their consent or without the consent of the United States Congress in a statute or in a treaty. An Indian tribe is a distinct, independent, political entity. It's not a mere aggregation of individuals or a racial group. It has powers of self-government that are derived from a pre-existing sovereignty limited only by their inclusion within the United States. This concept is very, very important. The political and legal status of Indians is not a race-based classification in the United States. We are extra constitutional entities in the United States. We enjoy a government to government relationship with the United States. Um, we saw this issue is playing out right now 
in the litigation that is um, pending certiorari in the United States Supreme Court where um, the state of Texas and other states have uh, sued um, for under the Indian Child Welfare Act. One of the arguments in that case is that the placement preferences of Indian children in non, for the placement preferences of Indian children to be placed in Indian homes is a race-based classification, that it violates the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. And this concept of Indians being a political and legal entity is right front and center in this case. Um, the Fifth Circuit, eight judges uh, agreed in the Fifth Circuit case that uh, Indians, that this is not a violation of the Equal Protection Clause because of their status, uh, their political and legal status in the United States. Um, there are several other cases we could go into, but we don't have the time today, but they basically recognize the inherent sovereignty um, of Indian tribes and that the powers of self-government are retained except to the extent they are divested by Congress in a federal statute or in a treaty. Now, for how tribal sovereignty is shaped by the three branches of government. The parameters of tribal sovereignty have been defined in over 200 years of Supreme Court decisions on the exercise of congressional and presidential power in dealings with Indians. There's one place in the United States Constitution that gives Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with Indian tribes. Um, this is uh, the basis for Congress's exercise of plenary power over Indian affairs. Um, early Supreme Court cases define the relationship with an Indian tribe as a protectorate relationship uh, between Indians in the United States and that concept is still a very foundational touchstone in federal Indian law today. Tribes are described as dependent, domestic dependent nations in a relationship with the United States that's similar to ward to guardian. In becoming part of the United States, the tribes did not surrender their right to self-government. The relationship is one of nation to nation and you've probably heard this government to government um, concept. Uh, they enjoy a government to government relationship with the United States. The United States federal government has exclusive authority to deal with Indian tribes to the exclusion of state governments. The federal Indian trust responsibility means that the United States owes a fiduciary duty to Indian tribes to protect their rights and interests and their lands and resources that are held in trust by the United States for their benefit. To be federally recognized is a term of art. It means that an Indian tribe is named on the list published by the secretary every year in the Federal Register under the List Act of 1994. But statutes and courts also determine re federal recognition. And we saw this year um, with the CARES Act litigation, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, in Yellen versus Chehalis, um, the question was whether or not Alaska Native corporations established under the Alaska Native Corp uh, Claim Settlement Act qualify as federally recognized tribes under the Indian Self-Determination Act for purposes of sharing in the CARES Act money that was passed by Congress. And this case went from the DC Circuit to the United States Supreme Court and in June, the Supreme Court held that while Alaska Native corporations are not federally recognized tribes in a sovereign political sense, they are Indian tribes under the plain definition in the Indian Self-Determination Act, and thus they are eligible to share in the CARES Act funds. Um, so turning to California, um, with those concepts in mind, um, California has a very unique history. We don't have treaties that were ever ratified by the United States Congress. Uh, there were 18 treaties that were negotiated in California uh, around the time of statehood and the gold rush. And these treaties reserved about seven and a half percent of the California land base. Um, they were never ratified. They were, they were sealed when they went back to Washington on purpose. Um, and in 1891, after excessive congressional testimony, about the harms and the wholesale stealing of Indian land and water in California, 
Congress um, passed the Mission Indian Relief Act. And um, it was passed on, with the specific purpose of protecting land and water rights for Southern California Indians. And then through federal appropriations um, in the early 20th century through 1928, uh, the Rancheria system in Central and Northern California was established. Today, there are 109 federally recognized tribes in the state of California. Um, and the land base that the tribes control in the state of California is less than 1%. So the um, sealing of the treaties had probably its intended effect, <laughs> which was to basically take California away from uh, its indigenous populations. Um, San Diego County, where Rincon is, um, is home to 18 federally recognized tribes. It is the most populous county in the United States with tribes. And I, thought, I, I always thought that was a very interesting factoid. Um, so how does tribal sovereignty express itself in self-government? Oftentimes it's tied to Indian territory, to reservations. Um, as sovereigns, tribes have the power to make their own laws and be governed by them within their territorial jurisdiction. Tribes also have the power to exclude persons who enter the reservation, and this includes the lesser power to place conditions on entry, continued presence, and on-reservation conduct and activities. In 2019, the Ninth Circuit held that a tribe's regulatory power over non-Indians is derived from its inherent sovereignty to exclude members from tribal land and from the tribe's inherent sovereign power to protect self-government and to control internal relations. In 1981, however, um, the United States Supreme Court severely restricted uh, tribal civil regulatory jurisdiction basically um, by saying that unless an exception applies, tribes cannot exercise civil regulatory jurisdiction over non-Indians on fee land within a reservation unless they are in a consensual relationship with the tribe, meaning they have a permit, a lease, a contract that that's, qualifies as a consensual relationship, then the tribe can exercise jurisdiction over them, or when the activities and conduct of a non-Indian has some direct effect on the political integrity, economic security, or health or welfare of the tribe. So they really narrowed in 1981 the scope of tribal civil regulatory jurisdiction on a reservation over non-Indians on fee lands. And for Rincon, this has been a big problem. We have here a picture of a landowner. This is an aerial shot of a five-acre parcel on the, on the Rincon Indian Reservation, a non-Indian landowner that operates several businesses on this property that, through experience, the Rincon tribe has had fire issues. We are in a very dangerous wildfire zone had fire issues from storage tanks exploding off of this property during the 2007 wildfire, the Pumacha wildfire. And um, we have a pristine water source on the reservation. This property oversits an aquifer. All of the reservation is on well water from this aquifer. And we cannot, we have not been successful in being able to regulate this individual. His, his businesses include abandoned trailers, junk cars, tractor trailers, refrigerator trucks with, with antifreeze and all kinds of chemicals in it. He has storage tanks on the property. He has hundreds of feet of electrical cord that is exposed through the property to provide electricity to the various uses he has on the property. I mean, it's just an unbelievable situation and there's just nothing yet we have been able to do. So we have been tied up in litigation for about 10 years and, the reason I'm bringing this up, though, is because of the importance of the Montana, the narrowing of the scope of jurisdiction that tribes have to create, um, to, to mitigate and abate activities that are threatening to the public health and safety of a tribe. Uh, if the actor is a non-Indian and the land status is fee, uh, tribes have a very narrow window uh, and opportunity to regulate these types of, of activities. But there is a bright spot because just this year in June, the United States Supreme Court in a unanimous decision reaffirmed the, um, the power of the two exceptions 
in the Montana case that allow a tribe to regulate uh, non-Indians passing through Indian country um, when their conduct threatens the public health and welfare of a tribe. In United States versus Cooley, you have a Crow uh, tribal police officer that pulled over to help a motorist late at night on the Crow Indian Reservation. And when he uh, talked to the motorist, he noticed the motorist was uh, intoxicated. Upon further you know, search of the car, he noticed there was a gun, they, um, there was a child in the car, and uh, there was methamphetamine in the car. So the tribal police officer pulled him out, you know, searched him and detained him. And at the um, hearing, uh, Cooley moved to suppress the evidence because the tribe didn't have regulatory jurisdiction over him. And based on Montana. And um, the Supreme Court in a 9-0 decision basically said, yes, they do. The tribe does have jurisdiction and the tribe can detain a non-Indian in Indian country and search a non-Indian in Indian country if the tribe believes, and that belief is reasonable, that there is a threat to public health and safety and welfare to the tribe. So um, it's a good day right now with regard to our case that's trickling up through the federal uh, uh, system on the issue of civil regulatory jurisdiction. Um, so how does uh, tribal sovereignty operate off-reservation, um, there are a couple of ways through express federal delegation. Tribes can be treated uh, just like a state or step into the shoes of the federal government under certain programs uh, just like a state would. In the space of protection of cultural resources, tribes can be uh, the functional equivalent of a state historic preservation office. They are known as tribal historic preservation officers and for purposes of protecting cultural resources under NAGPRA and the National Historic Preservation Act and the Archaeological Resources Act, tribes can um, operate just like a SHPO. Um, we have um, lots of examples of that in California. The California Native Heritage Commission maintains a list of all the TIPOs in California, uh, makes that list available to local jurisdictions like the, the the local jurisdiction here, I think it's San Jacinto or, or the city of Hemet, um, to facilitate notice and meaningful consultation uh, to project proponents seeking a permit under CEQA when those projects might impact um, aboriginal or cultural resources of an Indian tribe. Um, and you see there the map, the little tiny purple bubble in the map is the Rincon Indian Reservation. The black outline that goes all the way up into Riverside and out to the coast is the aboriginal footprint for Rincon's uh, TIPO program. So projects that are permitted under CEQA off reservation um, may involve uh, consultation with the Rincon Band's uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Office. And it's just an example of how tribes go off reservation with their tribal sovereignty. Another example is in the area of natural resources. Um, tribes under several EPA programs, mostly water and air, can be treated in the same manner as the state of California and other states. Um, they can promulgate tribal water quality standards under the Clean, air Act, uh, Clean Water Act and um, Section 401 certifications when, a, when a, um, a developer is getting a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers the tribe will be asked to certify. If you have treatment as a state and you have tribal water quality standards, you would be asked to certify that the project proponents activities aren't gonna degrade your water quality standards. Um, so you have a role even with off reservation users if they are upstream and that water's coming down through your jurisdiction and might degrade your tribal water quality standards. And the federal EPA is the enforcement arm for those tribal water quality standards. Um, air, same thing. Tribes can be treated as a state. They can operate programs just like the state of California that are pollution prevention in their jurisdictions. Um, and then the final example um, that I'm aware of is not an express federal delegation and it's also not um, extraterritorial, but I think it's important because it's uh, a new where 
under the Endangered Species Act, a lot of tribes are in rural areas and they have uh, protected, federally protected critters. Under the Endangered Species Act, um, tribes normally, every project they have to get a Section 7 permit from the service in order to develop that if the development has any kind of impact on a protected, uh, threatened or endangered species. Um, at Rincon, we have entered into a memorandum of understanding with the Bureau of Indian Affairs that gives the band ESA authority to permit projects on the reservation without going back to the service. We have one biological opinion that covers the entire reservation. We put 265 acres in preserve all along the river system, the surface waters of the reservation. And what this does is it decreases our development costs, right? And it the, shortens the time because trying to negotiate a biological opinion with the service can take at least a year to a year and a half. Uh, and it's for every development if it's within the uh, breeding zone of certain protected species. So this is another example of where the tribe's capacity as a government, because it has the right uh, capacity with it, the professionals that it has inside its government, uh, has been able to negotiate this kind of, of exercise of federal authority. Um, I think it's a, 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 a great example of um, kind of pushing the boundaries of tribal sovereignty where there isn't express federal delegation in the statute. Um, other powers, of course, tribes have the power to tax. Rincon has probably five taxes in its tax code. Uh, the tribal council every year passes an appropriation schedule. 100% of the money is dedicated to essential government services. Um, and every year, our Rincon tax collector publishes an annual tax report. That report is on our website if you want to see it. It just shows you where all of the funds went, and where, where they came from, and where all of them went. Um, we operate uh, public safety programs. That's probably our largest. Um, our, our fire department is uh, probably the government's largest expense. It's about a $4 million a year operation. Um, and without a tax base, it would be hard to make up for that money. Um, we also now have an ambulance service uh, to provide um, emergency ambulance uh, services on the reservation and the San Pasqual Indian Reservation. Um, and we also have an MOU with the San Diego County Sheriff, even though this is a PL-280 state, we uh, pay for two FTE sheriffs that are dedicated to the reservation. We pay for their rigs and their benefits and salary um, to make sure that we've got a police presence on the reservation. It's um, been a very, it's been a longstanding relationship we've had with the sheriff, but it's really contributed to um, the decrease in uh, crime and incident on the reservation. Now, how does tribal sovereignty operate in a commercial capacity? Gaming is probably the best example that we're gonna spend a lot of time on today. Um, in the 1970s, California tribes began to offer bingo and card games to non-Indians, and it led to disputes over what laws apply to these activities in Indian country. Two tribes sued California and Riverside County claiming that the application of state and local law violated their sovereignty. The Ninth Circuit and the district courts agreed with these tribes. In 1987, the Supreme Court of the United States also agreed. In the landmark case of California versus Cabazon, SCOTUS held that state and local governments under PL 280 have no ability to regulate activities on Indian lands absent the consent of Congress. SCOTUS also held that federal and tribal interests in self-government and economic self-sufficiency outweigh the state and the county's interest in enforcing its gambling laws, even against its own citizens in Indian country. In response to Cabazon, and at the request of several state AGs, Congress enacted the Indian Regulatory Gaming Act in 1988, which gave states a regulatory role in class three gaming through the requirement for a tribal state compact. In Prop 1A, that was passed in 2000, 63% of California voters allowed the tribal state compacts to go, that were negotiated by Gray Davis to go into effect. 
So today, what you see from these economic impacts, um, you have California growing into an $8 billion a year business. This represents 27% of the national market share. Um, and employing California tribes employ approximately 60,000 uh, employees statewide. This is a picture of the Rincon Harris Southern California Resort. The revenue from the operation of this resort, 98% of it operates the tribal government. Um, the Rincon Band also pays into the Revenue Sharing Trust Fund that provides gaming money to California's non-gaming and limited gaming tribes. Um, gaming revenue is also paid, there's a typo there, to the state distribution funds, which is to be primarily used to offset the state's costs in regulating gaming to the three agencies that are tasked with regulating gaming, the DOJ, the California Gambling Control Commission, and the Bureau of Gambling Control. These amounts are on top of the costs incurred to the band, which run about two million a year, for the Rincon Gaming Commission. Tribal gaming commissions are the primary regulators of the facilities in Indian Country. And then finally, uh, year over year, the Rincon Band has been giving about $750,000 to um, charitable causes uh, in, their local in our local jurisdiction. Our recent lead gifts were to Palomar Health Foundation and to the San Diego Food Bank, along with um, Higher Education and Veteran Affairs. And then finally, for some of the socioeconomic impacts of gaming, um, the Brookings Institution held a, a, a panel webinar uh, in 2019 that looked at the last 30 years of Indian gaming and also looking forward and came out with some recent research on the benefits of gaming um, and basically said that it has not only increased personal incomes in reservation communities with a corresponding rise in reservation GDP, but after 30 years of gaming, research is also showing positive impacts both on and off reservation through increased high school graduation rates, decreases in arrests, increased in civic engagement and voter rates, decrease in domestic violence, drug and alcohol abuse, and a reduction in smoking, heavy drinking, and obesity. Research is also showing some higher business survival rates from 2007 to 2012 for certain sectors and businesses located near Indian gaming facilities, and even through the 2008 recession. So there's been a lot of benefits of um, Indian gaming, and with that segue, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Glenn Feldman, who's going to talk about PL280 and its role in Indian gaming. Good afternoon. Thank you, Denise. Um, Denise has given you a really good overview of the concepts, uh, some of the concepts that go into the, the, the notion of tribal sovereignty. The next couple of sections of the program, we're going to drill down uh, a little more in a little more detail on um, what do I have to hit here? The, the arrow? What am I aiming at? Nothing. Oh, I think all right. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, we're going to drill down a little more in a little more detail on uh, tribal gaming, some of the history of tribal gaming, some of the legal concepts that underlie tribal gaming, both in California and nationally. And you can't do that without uh, understanding what we call PL280, and we'll get into that in a in a second. Um, one of the one of the black letter rules of federal Indian law is that state laws don't apply to tribes and tribal activities on reservations, except, and there are always exceptions in federal Indian law, except when Congress says that states may exercise that authority. Um, and Congress has that power uh, under what's called its plenary powers. Denise mentioned that it's a, it derives uh, directly from the US Constitution, which basically gave the federal government the right to regulate affairs with, uh, with Indian tribes in, in the United States. Um, so Congress really has, has, plays a tremendously important role in this. And uh, although the general rule is that tribes are not subject to state laws, uh, Congress, in its wisdom, back in 1953, enacted what was called PL, uh, Public Law 280, uh, Public Law 
83-280, which we now affectionately call PL280. PL280 gave six states, six specific named states, including California, authority for those states to exercise and to enforce state laws on reservations, powers that they would not have had but for the grant of authority from Congress. Um, so PL280 has two components. It has a civil law component and a criminal law component. Um, and we need to talk about those because they're, they operate differently. This is pretty cool, isn't it? Um, how those things flip around. Um, criminal juris the criminal side of PL280 is a lot easier to understand. The criminal law side basically says state criminal laws apply on the reservation, apply to tribes, tribal activities, tribal members on the reservation in the same way they do off the reservation. Again, a power that would, uh, uh, a situation that would not apply but for this grant of authority under PL280. So criminal jurisdiction, Criminal laws, the state's criminal laws apply on the reservation. The civil side of PL 280 is quite a bit more complicated. Um, so look at the uh, look at the top there. Uh, it says California, and then there are five or six other states shall have jurisdiction over civil causes of action to which Indians are parties, which arise in Indian country, to the same extent that such state has jurisdiction over other civil causes of action. So. That's pretty clear. Tri tribes, tribal members can go into state court and try to adju and adjudicate their rights. Um, so that part of it is pretty clear. But then there's another clause which has cre created the problem. It says, and those civil laws of such state that are of general application to private persons or private property shall have the same force and effect within such Indian country as they have elsewhere within the state. So the question is, is that second clause related to the first? That is, you go into state court and state laws apply to that case in state court, or is it a broader grant of authority? Is it basically saying, okay, clause one, you can, tribes can go into state court, clause two, and without regard to being in court, state civil laws apply on the reservation. Um, and that, you see, you see the distinction there? The, if, it's, if it was the second interpretation, it would basically make tribes subject to all state civil laws. Um, how this, how PL280, how the civil jurisdiction side of PL280 should be determined or should be interpreted has been the subject of a great deal of, uh, uh, of litigation over the years. Um, but in 1976, uh, the US Supreme Court in a case called Bryan versus Itasca County uh, was faced with a question of whether or not the state of Minnesota could impose its state taxes on some activities of a tribal member on a reservation in that state. And the court essentially held that the civil side of PL 280 was not a grant of full civil authority to the states, that it was intended to provide a mechanism by which tribes could go into court and have their private uh, uh, cases adjudicated there, but it was not intended to allow the state to apply all of its civil laws, its taxes, its regulatory authority, uh, those things to the state. So in 1976, uh, the court, the Supreme Court, uh, so held in, uh, in Bryan versus Tasca County, I won't read the quote there, the second paragraph, but, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it made fairly clear that the civil side of PL280 needed to be interpreted in a narrow, in a narrow way. Um, but states didn't like that very much, and states continued to press the argument that, uh, that Bryan was really just a tax case. They weren't setting forth any, any large principles of law. They were really just deciding whether the, whether the tribal member in that, in that uh, situation, in that case, owed $147 to the state of Minnesota. And that's, it was, it was over, that, that case, I may be wrong, but I think it was somewhere around 150 bucks that was an issue in that case, became a major Supreme Court decision. So um, that issue, the, the question of uh, the civil versus criminal sides of PL280 underlie the whole issue of tribal gaming, both in California and, uh, and uh, nationally. Um, and the way, that, the way that discussion has been framed 
um, is whether particular state laws are civil regulatory. Now, this applies only in PL-280 states. Remember, in other states, state laws don't apply at all. But in PL-280 states, the question is whether a particular state law is civil regulatory, in which case it does not, it cannot be applied by the state to tribes on the reservation, or whether it's a criminal prohibitory law, uh, which can be applied. So it's that civil regulatory versus criminal prohibitory distinction that, uh, as I say, underlies much of the debate and discussion about tribal gaming and how, how it developed. Um, and we've got uh, the Cabazon decision here decided in 1987. We're going to talk about this in much more detail, but the, the uh, upshot of that case was that the Supreme Court held that um, California's gambling laws, for the most part, were civil regulatory and therefore could not be applied uh, to the tribe on the reservation. And here, the, this, is, uh, this is one of the holdings in, in the Cabazon case, which sort of summarizes this distinction. If the intent of a state law is generally to prohibit certain conduct, it falls within PL-280's grant of criminal jurisdiction. But if the state law generally permits the conduct at issue, subject to regulation, it must be classified as civil regulatory, and PL-280 does not authorize its enforcement on an Indian reservation. The shorthand test is whether the conduct at issue violates the state's public policy. So that was the holding in Cabazon. And it, it sounds perhaps like that's a pretty simple distinction, but in the real world it isn't. So for example, in California, um, uh, California allows charitable organizations and others to, conduct, to uh, operate bingo games for prizes up to $250. But the minute you put a $251 prize uh, on the table, there are criminal penalties associated with that. So is that a civil regulatory law or a criminal prohibitory law? Um, and that, that was basically part of, uh, of what was decided, uh, discussed and decided in the Cabazon case. So now we're gonna talk a little bit in some detail, and this is a multimedia presentation, folks, so don't fall asleep. Um, we're gonna talk about the Cabazon case, uh, decided in 1987, and you ask, is that still relevant? Why are we still talking about Cabazon 30 some years later? Well, thanks for asking that question. Here's my answer. Um, in, in the early, late 70s and early 80s, uh, Congress recognized three Indian tribes in Texas. Uh, and those tribes in the state of Texas uh, tried to negotiate an agreement uh, that would outline the respective rights and obligations of both the tribes and the state with respect to these newly created tribes. And even though they thought they had, cre they had um, reached an agreement, well, they had reached an agreement of some sort, and Congress then went ahead and passed a specific law dealing with these Texas tribes, uh, passed in 1987. And almost from the minute that law went out of the books, the state and the, the three tribes in Texas have been fighting over what that law means, how it's to be interpreted. And there are provisions in that te specific Texas law that deal with gambling, with gaming, what the tribes can do, what rights the state has over, over regulating and enforcing gaming laws on those reservations. And they've been litigating that issue for 25 years, but up and down in the courts, back and forth. Well, last week, the US Supreme Court agreed to hear an appeal in this, issue, in this case, in this specific Texas case. And the issue that the Supreme Court's gonna decide in 2022 is whether or not that Texas law should be interpreted in accordance with the principles and standards announced in the Cabazon case. So 35 years later, the court is still dealing with the issues that were raised in Cabazon in 1986 and 1987. So I guess there is still some limited relevance of what that case uh, had to say. Um, so we're gonna talk now about uh, the Cabazon case. Um, just as by way of background, um, the Cabazon band, small reservation out in, out in the desert, um, back in the 70s, they had tried any number of um, uh, methods to try to raise tribal revenues. They'd been engaged in cigarette sales, they'd been engaged in um, um, uh, 
mail order liquor sales, uh, which, which we learned, which we quickly learned violated about 42 federal laws, but uh, they, <laughs> they tried nevertheless. And they finally landed on, on gaming. Um, and the Cabazons, uh, you know, believe in, in exercising their rights. They, they believe they're a government. They believe if you are a government, you have to act like a government. You exercise rights like a government. They looked around California and saw that there were over 400 poker rooms operating in California, commercial poker rooms. Local governments had the right to authorize or prohibit uh, the operation of commercial poker rooms in, within their jurisdictions. And Cabazon said, well, if every little town and village can decide whether they want to have it, as a tribal government on the reservation, we can decide whether to have a, a, a poker room. And they authorized, uh, by ordinance, uh, a tribal poker room. They opened in the fall of 1980. And within days, the city of Indio, who argued that the reservation was within the city boundaries, um, sent a SWAT team in of 25 or 30, probably the entire Indio police force, I suppose, all wearing vests and Kel you know, Kevlar helmets and carrying AK-47s and whatever else they do, uh, went in, shut the place down, um, confiscated the tables, the chairs, the chips, the cash, uh, cited about 30 people for unlawful, uh, for unlawful gambling. Uh, the tribe within days went into federal court and filed what turned out to be the first of several lawsuits over this question of whether or not states or local governments can regulate gaming activities on tribal lands. Um, the next couple of pages, I've got several slides here that deal with the timeline of the case. This is interesting. When I do this presentation for lawyers, this is pretty interesting because there's some pr interesting procedural things that happened during this litigation. For present purposes, though, let me just tell you that it took almost seven years to resolve that issue. These things don't get decided quickly. Um, and so while the original case was filed in October of 1980, uh, and we went up through the district court in the Ninth Circuit twice, um, it wasn't until uh, April of 1986 where this, when the state of California asked the US Supreme Court to review the decisions in this case. We had won in most of uh, uh, in most of the lower case lower court decisions, the Supreme Court uh, in 1986 in April of 1986 was asked by the state to review that decision. The Supreme Court rejects about 98 percent of the requests to hear to 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 uh, hear appeals. They they get thousands and thousands of requests and they hear a very very small number of of uh, cases, uh, but. To our chagrin, in June of 1986, the court agreed to hear the case. Uh, now, of course, we're not happy about that. We had won below. We're, we're perfectly happy with the decision. We don't want anybody messing around with it. Well, here in June of 86, the Supreme Court says we're going to hear we're going to hear this case. Um, in December of 86, we argue the case before the court, and in February of 1987, the Supreme Court rules in a six to three decision. Um, I should mention that. Um, Although this is called the Cabazon case, by the time it got to, I think, the Ninth Circuit, before it got to the Supreme Court, uh, the Morongo Band had joined the case. Morongo had, a, had, a, had its own case. George and Barbara Karshmer were litigating on behalf of Morongo. Uh, I was representing Cabazon. There were two cases. They raised essentially the same issues. The, at some point, the court consolidated those two cases um, because my case had been filed a day or two earlier, it became known as the Cabazon case. That might, otherwise, it might have been the Morongo case, George, if uh, you guys had been a little quicker to get to the courthouse. Um, you still won the court <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> that wouldn't have changed. Um, so in any event, what, what I'm about to describe uh, when I talk about Cabazon, it really involves both Cabazon and Morongo. And by the time the case got up to this level, we were talking not only about poker, the original Cabazon poker room, but we were also talking about bingo. Both Cabazon and Morongo by then had opened high stakes bingo parlors on the reservation. As I mentioned, California allows bingo, but only up to a $250 jackpot. The tribes were offering significantly more than that in their, um, in their, um, in their bingo parlors. So um, the Cabazon case was not the first tribal gaming case by a long shot. And, uh, um, let's see here. 
as you can see on the screen, there were at least three other cases, and I'll mention another one, that preceded Cabazon. Uh, we had the Oneida tribe, and I should mention each of these arose, I'm not sure if it's coincidental or not, in a PL 280 state. So in each of these cases, this issue of civil regulatory versus criminal prohibitory was a, an important factor. So we had the Oneida tribe in Wisconsin operating a uh, high stakes bingo parlor, um, Seminole tribe in Florida, and the Barona band right here uh, 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 doing the same thing. And in each of these cases, the lower courts uh, ruled in favor of the tribe, sometimes uh, not happily. So the, the judge in the Oneida case, uh, 1981, uh, this was part of her conclusion. She said, although I, can, although I conclude that Wisconsin bingo laws are civil rather than criminal, I admit to a certain uneasiness in reaching that conclusion. So you can see we were sort of, sort of uh, uh, carving new law here. We were creating new law and requiring judges to make some decisions that sometimes they weren't per particularly comfortable with. Um, so we had these three cases. I should also mention the Mashantucket Pequots uh, on the East Coast uh, were also involved in litigation. And their, their litigation was important f uh, because they had actually, by 1986, they had actually gotten the federal government to provide some funding for their bingo parlor when they were, they were building a new bingo parlor and somehow got some sort of HUD grant or something. Uh, so the federal government was sort of invested in this now and that became important. The Supreme Court mentioned that in, in its opinion. So we have these cases uh, all arising earlier than Cabazon. You see that Seminole and Barona, where it says cert denied there, cert denied 1982, cert denied 93. That means the, the state in both those cases asked the Supreme Court to review those decisions and the Supreme Court said no. They denied those petitions, as they do, as I said, with about 98% of, of the applications. So why did, um, why did the court agree to hear the Cabazon case in 1986 when it had refused to hear cases, or decide, declined to hear cases, I should say, earlier in the 1980s? Well, I think the answer is that Supreme Court justices uh, pay attention to what's going on around them, not just in the courtroom, but what's going on in the real world. And so in the early 80s, there were just a handful of tribal gaming facilities, mostly bingo parlors, uh, on reservations in the country. But by 1985, look at the explosion. By 1985, in just a couple of years, you have over 100 tribal gaming facilities uh, nationally, with more than 25 in California. So I think by 1986, the Supreme Court realized this was an issue that was not going to go away, and I think they sat down and said, we need to, we need to decide something about this. We need to get involved in this. Um, so in 1986, the court agrees to hear the Cabazon and Morongo case, uh, and we go to, uh, to the Supreme Court. Now, the, Supreme, uh, the, the state, I think, felt that they had a very strong case. They felt pretty good about their position, even though they had lost in the lower courts. They felt pretty good, and their, they based their principal arguments on what I call the trilogy of sin. So we have Washington versus Colville involved cigarette sales, tribes selling cigarettes to non-Indians on the reservation without charging state, uh, state cigarette taxes. The US Supreme Court in 1980 says, tribes, you cannot do that. States have the right to require you tribes to collect state sales taxes on those cigarette sales to non-Indians. And the court said, basically because, because tribes, you are simply marketing an exemption from state law. No reservation value is being added to these transactions. Now remember those terms, marketing exemption, reservation value, because they, you're gonna see them again in, in the Cabazon case. Uh, Rice versus Rayner, Liquor sales. Supreme Court says tribes, if you want to sell liquor, you have to get a state liquor license as required under federal law. And then United States versus Dakota. Um, Fred Dakota, a member of the Sioux tribe somewhere in the Midwest, opens a little casino in his garage, puts a couple of slot machines in his garage, um, claiming you know, that, that uh, you know, immunity from all laws. Well, the feds disagreed. The feds come in, raid him, shut him down. The feds now, not the state. The, the Justice Department, the FBI. Um, Fred Dakota says, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've got to talk about this civil regulatory versus criminal prohibitory distinction. That's critical to my defense. The, the uh, judge says, nope, 
not in a federal prosecution. That applies in state, in state, in cases involving state law, but this is a federal violation, and that, and that uh, distinction doesn't make any difference here. By the way, you're guilty. Um, so, um, and interesting enough, Fred Dakota, who I have no idea who he was actually, died recently, and the Wall Street Journal had a long obituary about the guy, talking about this, this little casino that he, uh, that he created in his garage. So Fred, Fred lives on because he decided to put a couple of slot machines in his garage back in the, uh, the mid-80s. So we've got these cigarette tax, liquor licensing, and gambling cases, and the state's feeling pretty good about arguing that those cases are the applicable precedents here. Now, even though the Cabazon case involved just two small, relatively small tribes in California, I think by 1986, both the states and the tribes understood this case was going to have pretty significant impact, whichever way it came out. So uh, amicus briefs are friend of the court briefs filed by folks who are not parties to the lawsuit but want to express views one, supporting one side or the other. And you can see there were four state briefs on behalf of 27 states and eight, eight uh, uh, amicus briefs filed on behalf of 66 tribes. So as I say, I think, the tr I think certainly both sides understood this case was going to have some, some significant impact. Um, another interesting thing, probably more interesting to lawyers and others, uh, the Supreme Court, when, when Indian law cases arise in which the government, the US government is not a party, the Supreme Court almost always asks the, the, the United States government, what are the views of the United States in this case? Where, where do you come down on this, on this dispute? Well, for reasons that I've never understood and never will, the Supreme Court did not ask the Justice Department for its views. They actually go to the Solicitor General in the Justice Department. The Supreme Court did not ask the uh, government for its views in this case. Many years later, we, we heard that um, we knew, I should say this, we knew that there was a split in the federal government over this issue with the Interior Department and the BIA generally supporting the tribe's position and the Justice Department, particularly the, particularly the criminal uh, element of the Justice Department, criminal division of the Justice Department, strongly favoring the tribes. So we had a federal government split there. Um, the, the, the Solicitor General didn't have to say anything to the court, but we heard later that the Solicitor General was very pleased that he did not have to uh, express those views because as he, as he put it, this was simply a policy dispute within the government and he didn't feel it was his role to try to, uh, try to resolve that policy dispute. So uh, December 1986, we go to the US Supreme Court. So here they are. Um, looks a little different today. So in those days, seven old white guys, um, not that I have anything against old white guys, you understand. Um, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman on the court, and of course, uh, African-American Justice, uh, Justice um, Marshall, almost forgot his name. Um, so these are the folks who are gonna decide the case. So we have oral argument in December of 1986. Uh, the state's arguments, they're arguing the Colville analogy, the cigarette tax case. They're saying the tribes are simply marketing an exemption from state law. They argue there's no federal legislation or regulation governing these activities. And as you'll see, an argument that makes, you know, seems odd today, but was a major part of their argument in 1986, that if you let these tribes operate gaming, organized crime is gonna come in and the Bonanno family from New York is gonna be running these operations before you know it. Um, our arguments looked very different. Uh, we were taking the position that this case was basically decided by Bryan versus Itasca County, the civil regulatory versus criminal prohibitory distinction, and our argument that California's gambling laws were civil, fell on the civil regulatory side and therefore were not applicable on the reservation. Um, we argued that there was preemption under federal law and that allowing the state to regulate these activities or prohibit these activities would be an infringement on tribal uh, sovereignty and self-government. Let me mention just for a minute about this preemption argument because uh, it turned out to be important. Preemption in the Indian law context generally means that if the federal government, Congress passes a law dealing with Indian affairs that states cannot by enacting a, a law of their own 
undo that. In other words, federal law trumps state law uh, with respect to Indian affairs. So that's the idea of preemption. State, federal laws preempt contradictory or contrary state laws. Well, of course, in 1986, we didn't have any federal law that directly spoke to tribal gaming. But we did have, we did have and we were able to present uh, and had developed a record in the case that gave us a pretty good argument in support of, uh, in support of federal preemption here. So no specific federal law dealing with gaming, but there were several federal laws that have been enacted in the 60s, 70s, uh, early 80s, um, the Indian Financing Act, the Indian Self-Determination Act, and others, which specifically said that it is the policy of the United States to try to, you know, to, to um, promote economic development on reservations, to strengthen tribal governments, and, and um, while they didn't mention gaming in particular, we thought that was pretty good language. Um, in addition, by 1983, President Reagan had issued an Indian policy statement, as presidents sometimes do. Um, and, in his, uh, and in his policy statement, the president said that tribes need to find ways to generate more revenues on the reservation. You know, stop, stop relying on the federal government tribes. You guys need to go out and find ways to raise your own monies. Ha! Huh. Wait a minute, that sounds pretty much like what exactly what we were doing. Um, so we were able to get some high BIA officials to sign affidavits attesting to the fact that it was the, at least the BIA's position, that the tribal gaming activities at issue in the Cabazon case fit squarely within the Reagan policy statement. That the, that the president's statement was exactly, we were doing exactly what President Reagan had instructed us to do. Um, in addition, by that time, the Secretary of the Interior, although he had no particular legislative authority to do so, was actually approving uh, management agreements. So if a tribe entered into a management agreement to run a bingo, uh, run its bingo halls with an outside operator, and a tribe wanted to, they could submit that agreement to the Secretary, and if it seemed reasonable, the Secretary would approve it. Uh, again, there was no legislative authorization for that, but it was just something that they were being that they were doing. But again, it seemed like some federal gloss on this whole thing, you know, which is what we're looking for. We're looking to argue, well, the federal government is supporting this. Well, if the secretary is signing off on management agreements, that sounds like some sort of federal support. And then finally, as I mentioned before, the Mashantucket Pequots had actually gotten the feds to put some money into the construction of a bingo hall. So um, again, this is, while it's sort of circumstantial evidence, it was evidence that we thought was fairly important uh, to demonstrate federal preemption in this case. And it turns out the court agreed with us and, and in several footnotes noted some of these factors as part of the, uh, part of the support for the position it, it ultimately took. So we have oral argument on December 9th, 1986. February 25th, just a couple of months later, Supreme Court issues a six to three ruling and the headlines tell the story. So now we get to the multimedia part. I doubt many of you have heard, or maybe many of you have not heard, uh, a Supreme Court argument. So we're gonna hear a little bit of the give and take here in the Cabazon case. The issues the justices are raising, the responses of the various lawyers and how they fit into the overall um, uh, the overall uh, scheme of the case. So, um, first one I mentioned that the, uh, the state's position was heavily, you know, the state relied heavily on the argument that uh, organized crime, there's a terrible organized crime threat here. The tribes simply couldn't keep organized crime out of tribal casinos. And uh, the justices raised this issue very quickly and raised it with the lawyer for the state. Now we're gonna see if this works. Umber, your, your reputation is on the line. We're gonna see if this works. I just asked this question. Uh, you mentioned, and your brief also mentions, uh, organized crime and the danger of infiltration. Is there any evidence that organized crime has infiltrated uh, bingo operations of the tribes that are before us? Um, any evidence in this record? Not in the record, not in the record. But if, to, to fully answer your question, Justice Powell, I would have to go outside the record 
And I'm reluctant to do that. I want to withdraw the question. Then, then you, you, argue in, you argue in your brief that that is a concern of the state of California. Yes. The, uh, the, the possibility that the bingo operations may be taken over by organized crime is, is a very serious concern to the state of California. Uh, we did, by the way, indeed concede below that we do not allege, quote, we do not allege the existence of organized crime in this case. We have never conceded that organized crime may or may not be involved in this case. Um, but our view is that California law is intended to pre prevent organized criminal infiltration before it takes place, rather than simply uh, eradicate a criminal operation after it has actually occurred. Now, early in the case, back in the district court, uh, we had entered into a stipulation with the state over what the facts were. These, these cases, there were no trials in either the Cabazon or Morongo cases. There were no trials, you know, like sort of a Perry Mason trial, people up on the witness stand and being badgered by lawyers. There were, no, there were no disputes over facts in these cases. They were all legal issues. And when you have a situation like that, cases get resolved under what is called a, under called motions for summary judgment. And that basically means, Your Honor, we've agreed on the facts. We're not disputing the facts, but there are legal issues arising from those facts. And among the legal, among the facts that we got the state to agree to, uh, early on in this case was that they were not alleging that there was any organized crime involvement with either the Cabazon or Morongo bingo uh, uh, parlors or gaming operations. Now, I think if they knew three or four years later what they were agreeing to, they never would have done that. But for whatever reason, they weren't thinking, they weren't thinking three or four years ahead. They, they agreed to that, and, and it became a major issue. Our position was, how can they be arguing that there's organized crime when they've already stipulated there is no organized crime? So I wanted to make that point uh, to the court after that discussion they had with the, uh, the lawyer for the state. Um, let me turn for a moment to this question of organized crime. What we're dealing here on the part of the state of California is at most a hypothetical concern. They've stipulated to the fact that there is no organized crime involvement on either the Cabazon or Morongo reservation. Now they draw some distinction between whether they are alleging that it is or it isn't. I think I, I didn't understand them to stipulate that there wasn't any. They, they, they just, just said they haven't alleged any to be there. Well, they said they hadn't alleged it. My question is, if I was representing the state and I knew of some, I don't think I would keep it a secret. I think I would get it out before the court. They say there's a real danger. That's well, what they say. They say there's a real danger, but the evidence points directly in the opposite direction. The Ninth Circuit concluded that there was no evidence of organized crime. So we have that discussion, and um, at the end of the day, the court concludes that the state's interest in preventing the infiltration of tribal bingo enterprises by organized crime does not justify state regulation of the tribal bingo enterprises in light of the compelling federal and tribal interests supporting them. State regulation would impermissibly infringe on tribal government. And they also mention in the, in the uh, decision, um, they say that while this organized crime concern is surely a legitimate concern, we are unconvinced that it is sufficient to escape the preemptive force of federal and tribal interests in this case. California does not allege any present criminal involvement in the Cabazon and Morongo enterprises, and the Ninth Circuit discerned none. So they agreed with us on the uh, uh, um, organized crime issue and basically said whatever theoretical threats it, provide, it, it, it presents are not sufficient to overcome the tribes and the federal government's interest in uh, permitting these activities. Um, then we get to the Colville analogy. Th analogy. This is the cigarette tax case, the, the, um, the issue of whether or not the tribes are simply marketing an exemption from state law. And here, um, Justice O'Connor uh, took this issue directly to me. I, I think I'd gotten three or four sentences out of my mouth, and we had this exchange. Gentlemen, I guess the most obvious concern about your position in the case is the concern we would have that the tribes are marketing an exemption from state law and the analogy to the cigarette tax situation. As in well, Your Honor, we think the situation here is, is considerably different than that presented uh, in Colville. I would note at the outset that in the cigarette tax case, uh, that the incidence of the tax at issue there was on non-Indians. 
In this case, the incidence of the state's jurisdictional scheme is directly on the tribes themselves. So the question of whether the state has jurisdiction to, to uh, regulate these activities is a considerably different one. They are Getting back to the question, uh, question of marketing and exemption, the key element there, I think, was, uh, was that the tribes were, were not providing what was called value generated on the reservation. Here, the situation is quite different. There you had people coming out of the reservation, buying cigarettes which had been imported from elsewhere, and then taking the cigarettes off and evading the state, the obligation to pay state tax. What the tribes are offering here are recreational services, plain and simple. Okay. So, at that point, Justice Rehnquist, the Chief Justice, said to me, well, if you're not market, if the tribes aren't marketing an exemption from state law, why do people get in their cars and drive long distances to go to these tribal facilities when they've got charitable bingo parlors down at the local Catholic church? And so we had this exchange. Bingo players don't require very much. Bingo players want a chair with a little padding and smoke eaters that will clear the air and get the cigarette smoke out. And if you can provide that better than the guy down the street, then you are going to attract more people to your bingo. I'm being serious. That, that's what these games are offering. They're, the tribes have built large, modern, clean, well-lit facilities, and they provide a chance for... for... No, this is my argument. Uh, <laughs> but what we're providing are recreational services here, and, and there's there's no indication why people go to one bingo as opposed to the other. But but the creature comforts certainly have something to do with. What the justice asked me was, is this a commercial for your client? He said, uh, and I said, no, this is actually my argument. Um, but joking aside. Uh, we got the court to agree with us. And so in their decision, the court says, these players, these bingo players, do not simply drive onto the reservation, make purchases and depart, but spend extended periods of time there, enjoying the services the tribes provide. The tribes have a strong incentive to provide comfortable, clean, and attractive facilities and well-run games in order to increase attendance at the games. And then they finish up by saying, here the tribes are not merely importing a product onto the reservation, for me, resale, they built modern facilities, recreational opportunities, uh, ancillary services. The Cabazon and Morongo bands are generating value on the reservation through activities in which they have substantial interest. Again, uh, not, uh, we, we are providing reservation value. What, was, what wasn't provided in the cigarette tax cases, we were able to distinguish in this case. So uh, again, the court agrees with us on that issue. Um, and we get to the Bryan versus Task County, the regulatory versus uh, civil regulatory versus prohibitory distinction. Uh, and this was really, in many ways, the crux of our case. We couldn't win this case if we couldn't convince the court that the state laws at issue here involving bingo and poker uh, were civil regulatory uh, as opposed to uh, civil, civil regulatory as opposed to criminal prohibitory. Um, and so we made our arguments but I hadn't convinced Justice Scalia very well, as you'll see. Justice Scalia, as many of you know, became sort of the leader of the, the most conservative uh, uh, element on the Supreme Court later in his career. This, this argument in 1986, it was, he, was just, he had just been appointed to the court. This was, this was his first year on the court, but he was no shy, retiring guy. He, he jumped in and, and argued with lawyers pretty aggressively, and this is the exchange we had on on this issue. Why is the, the difference between roulette wheels and bingo cards more, more significant as to whether it constitutes a prohibition as opposed to merely a regulation than the difference between bingo for under $250 and bingo for a million dollars? Well, the difference that, that's more important. Uh, that distinction more important. In other words, I'm asking, are you sure that this is just a regulation and not a prohibition? California prohibits bingo for more than $250. Just like well, prohibiting roulette wheels. California permits but regulates the playing of bingo. Not, not for over $250. Well, the question is, are you focusing on the 
penal sanction, or are you focusing on the total regulatory scheme? So I'm focusing on the activity. Why isn't it realistic here, in light of the interest involved, to consider the activity bingo for more than $250? And that is absolutely prohibited in California. Uh, I think uh, California is prohibiting high stakes bingo. And California is offering high stakes bingo. The question becomes this Does the inclusion of a penal sanction in their regulatory scheme give them jurisdiction over these tribal activities? That's the question you're asking. If, if the inclusion of that penal sanction, which establishes the outside limit of their regulatory scheme, does that give them jurisdiction? Our answer to that under Brian is absolutely not. If that were the law, Brian would be gutted. Brian says states were not authorized to exercise general regulatory jurisdiction over all of them. Brian held was that a tax statute couldn't be applied in a task accounting. Well, that was the issue. But the court used the phrase civil regulatory jurisdiction, including taxation, for a time. So that's the crux of the issue here. Are these California laws civil regulatory or criminal prohibitory? Obviously, Justice Scalia didn't agree with our analysis, but fortunately, six members of the court did. And uh, they say, uh, in Bryan versus Tasca County, we interpreted uh, PL 280 to grant states jurisdiction over private civil litigation involving reservation Indians in state court, but not to grant general civil regulatory authority. Um, and then they go on to say, we are persuaded that the prohibitory regulatory distinction is consistent with Brian's construction of PL 280. In light, and this is, this is a, this part that gets quoted a lot in, from the Cabazon case. In light of the fact that California permits a substantial amount of gambling activity, including bingo, and actually promotes gambling through its state lottery, we must conclude that California regulates rather than prohibits gambling in general and bingo in particular. So that being uh, the case, the court agreed with us uh, that these were civil regulatory laws, and as, as we talked about earlier, held that the state of California could not enforce those laws against the tribal uh, activities uh, involving the high stakes bingo and the poker. So just another point or two I want to make. Oops, wait a minute. Um, as I said, there was no, um, there was no federal law authorizing these activities at the time. Um, and um, the state made much of that, uh, but in fact, Congress had been considering these activities for a couple of years. There were, there were bills uh, uh, introduced in both the Senate and the House back in the early 80s that would have regulated tribal gaming in one way or another. So there was some discussion uh, amongst the justices about those issues, and uh, they asked the attorney for the state uh, about that. Pending in the Congress now that uh, would uh, federal legislation that would authorize these games and regulate them too. Well, there was a, an Indian bingo bill, or an Indian gambling bill, that passed the House and then passed a Senate Select Committee, but it was not approved on the floor of the House. And we entered, as far as I understand, across to the end of the session. Right? Uh, yes, but there was more to it than that. I understand that there was a, a strong opposition on the floor of the Senate to the bill. And also, Wait, would that bill have authorized the tribes to conduct the, these games? Yes, it would have. And also have regulated how they conduct? Yes, it would have provided both for authorization and for regulation. Yeah, sorry, the quality of that's getting, it's, the quality's deteriorating a bit. These, this comes from an old cassette tape. Um, but, but the, the attorney for the state was conceding that there was, there was legislation pending in both the Senate and the House that would have authorized tribal gaming and regulated it in some way. And I wanted to sort of follow up on that point.
didn't get that right. That, that just repeated the, the uh, lawyer for the state's argument. But then I went on, and I think we probably are. Well, for whatever reason. Oh, this is, okay. This is, this is my, my response. Our, our belief is, based on some information, that the legislation is going to be reintroduced immediately upon Congress coming back into session. We have some reason to think that it will perhaps be more successful. So that discussion seemed to satisfy the majority, but was a significant issue for the dissent. So we had three dissenting justices, Scalia, uh, Stevens, and O'Connor. I won't read this, but they basically are saying, you know, un unless and until Congress acts, we, don't, we think the states have the authority to regulate these games. Uh, and again, based a significant part of their thinking on the fact that there was no federal legislation authorizing or regulating tribal gaming at that time. So one last note here. Uh, Justice uh, O'Connor and I have this discussion about casino gambling. Sounds a little odd. Remember, this was 30 some years ago. Do you think the tribe could open casino gambling on the reservation? The answer to that is clearly no. Under, 11, uh, under 15 U.S.C. section 1175, the use of possessions of certain mechanical gambling devices is a federal offense. That relates primarily to slot machines, roulette wheels, wheels of fortune. Uh, so in no instance could those activities take place on an Indian reservation. It would be immediately uh, in violation of federal law. So... <laughs> Not very prophetic, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm telling you, just, no, in no way, in no shape or form can tribes operate casinos on their reservations. Well, in my defense, that was true then. There were federal laws that prohibited the use of certain slot machines and other mechanical devices on Indian reservations. That, that's one of the laws that Fred Dakota got, got uh, convicted under. So what I said then was true, technically true, and led to the enactment of a, a, about 18 months after the Cabazon decision uh, was, was issued, led to uh, federal legislation that did just what the dissenters said needed to be done. And with that, I will turn the clicker over to George. Thank you, Glenn. Um, I wanted to add a couple of little glosses to uh, your really excellent review of, of PL 280. And one of the issues uh, that emerged fairly on is what is a law of the state versus, for example, a county ordinance? And uh, in a case that was cited in Bryan, but uh, a Ninth Circuit case called Santa Rosa versus Band versus King, Kings County, the Ninth Circuit said that a county ordinance is not a law of the state within the meaning of PL 280. Another the case that George litigated, as I, as I yes, recall. Yes, that's true. Um, against the state, the same state AG, Rod Walston, that argued uh, against Glenn in the Cabazon case. He was at that time the state's chief antagonist to, uh, to tribal rights, including Klamath River fishing rights and hunting rights. Um, the other thing that Brian did was differentiate between PL-280's reach as to tribal individual Indians and the tribes themselves. And in a footnote, the court said that PL-280 had not granted the states any jurisdiction over the tribes themselves. It did not abrogate tribal sovereign immunity. And, and Saboba actually had brought its own case in 1983 where it was represented by Harrison Hertzberg the father of a current state legislative, uh, Bob Hertzberg. So the, the, the histories of these things are really intertwined. Okay, um, it, it's been 18 months since I've used one of these things. So uh, am I, how is it not changing? Uh, I don't know, you're supposed to just hit that, right, that, hit that, that arrow. Oh, maybe I'm pointing at the wrong thing. No, I was pointing up here. Pointed at the, there ah, there you go. okay. So now we're going to discuss the Indian Regulatory Gaming Regulatory Act, or IGRA. Um, I'm not going to take you so far down into the weeds that anybody's going to have an allergy attack, but I'll try and hit the hit the high points. Ah, okay. 
That's better. Uh, Oops. Oh, there we go. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> Went a, a screen too far. Two screens too far. Oh my God, come on. Well, okay. I'll skip the first slide. No, no, no problem. The, the, the first slide was entitled, Tribes Were Not Given the Right to Engage in Government Gaming. Uh, and this goes back to something that Denise talked about, and which was sovereignty. Uh, tribes have the right to do government gaming because they are sovereign and they are governments. They're not private organizations. And that's the key to a, a lot of what follows in IGRA. So IGRA codified the Cabazon decision. It was the result of several years of work. Glenn mentioned that uh, in the Cabazon case, there was a record created. That record included the legislative history that tribes basically wrote in what led up to IGRA that included the Secretary of the Interior prescribing guidelines for management contracts that found their way into IGRA itself that was based basically on an early Morongo uh, management contract. So the IGRA had several goals, two of which are really important to promote tribal economic development, tribal self-sufficiency, strong tribal government, and uh, to protect uh, tr tribal gaming from infiltration from criminal elements, but recognizing that tribes have the exclusive right to regulate gaming activity on Indian lands if it isn't specifically prohibited by federal law and is conducted within a state which does not, as a matter of criminal law and public policy, the Cabazon language, prohibit such activity. So it had a number of stated purposes uh, to provide the statutory basis for the operation of gaming by tribes uh, as a me means of promoting tribal economic development, self-sufficiency, and strong tribal government. Uh, to provide a basis, a statutory basis for tribal regulation of gaming to shield from organized crime, uh, to ensure that the tribe is the primary beneficiary of the operation, and to ensure that the gaming is conducted fairly and honestly by the operator and the players, and to establish the NIGC, uh, and which had the, the authority to uh, address con congressional concerns and to protect the gaming as a means of generating tribal revenue. The NIGC's jurisdiction, as we'll see, is, is uh, somewhat limited. Um, oh, come on. All right, so the first, one of the first things that IGRA does is define Indian lands, which is not coextensive with Indian country. Indian lands are lands typically within the boundaries of a reservation over which a tribe exercises government authority. Those lands need not necessarily be held in trust. Uh, there, are several, uh, there are several tribes that have established casinos on fee lands within the boundaries of their reservations. There are tribes that have established their casinos on allotted land within the reservations. But um, generally, IGRA prohibits gaming on lands taken into trust after October 17, 1988, the day that the statute was signed into law. What are some of those exceptions? If a tribe didn't have a reservation on October 17, 1988, or if there's a restored lands, um, or if the land is contiguous to an existing reservation, or if the land was taken into trust as part of what's called a two-part determination, where the Secretary of the Interior, in consultation with the tribe, surrounding tribes, and other non-tribal governments determines that it would be in the best interests of the tribe and not detrimental to other, uh, to other governments to do so. Those are relatively rare. Uh, the two most prominent in California uh, were the North Fork and Enterprise determinations. California Supreme Court determined that the governor did not need legislative authority to concur in a secretarial determination. That's the other aspect of it, the governor has to concur. Um, but with respect to North Fork, the Court of Appeal, when, w when it was remanded by the state Supreme Court, uh, the Court of Appeal ruled that the referendum that overturned the state's legislature's ratification of the North Fork Compact nullified the governor's authority to concur. And so that, that project 
uh, remains in limbo. Uh, so IGRA, we've, we've heard talk about class one, class two, class three. IGRA categorizes uh, the three types of gaming, uh, giving tribes exclusive jurisdiction over so-called class one, ceremonial or traditional games and social games for minimal prizes. Uh, tribes have primary jurisdiction over class two, bingo, games similar to bingo, and non-banking and, and non-percentage card games to the extent that they are not prohibited affirmatively by state law. And class three, a tribe has to have a compact in order to do class three. Class three is everything that isn't class one or class two. And unlike class two, which a tribe can do if the state doesn't affirmatively prohibit it, we learned in the Rumsey case that in order for a tribe to do class three and get a compact for class three, the state must affirmatively allow that particular form of gaming. And it's not just class three as a whole, but rather specific subsets of class three gaming. So how does it do it? Uh, the NIGC has to approve management contracts. And the whole question of what is a management contract uh, or a collateral agreement to a management contract versus a consulting agreement or a financing agreement is something of ongoing interest, particularly as sports betting uh, becomes more prominent. Uh, the NIGC recently issued a new guidance on distinguishing between management, uh, when something is or is not a management contract, when the NIGC will or will not issue a declination letter saying, no, that's not a management contract. Uh, hmm? What, oh, did I, am I getting ahead of, oh, yeah, I forgot, sorry. Okay, technologically impaired. I prefer stone tablets. They, uh, <laughs> I grew up with those, uh, you know, right? So um, the, one of the issues is that the tribe has to have sole proprietary interest uh, in and be the primary beneficiary of the gaming operation. Again, this is something that is of greater relevance today in the sports betting uh, world than, than it is now in the traditional casino uh, context. Um, IGRA completely preempted whatever jurisdiction California or any state otherwise might have to enforce its gambling laws in Indian country. So uh, even if a, state, a state's gambling law was criminal prohibitory, IGRA would oust the state of jurisdiction to enforce that. And it assimilated state laws, state gambling laws, with, ex with the exception of class one and class two, into federal law and gave the Department of Justice exclusive ju jurisdiction to enforce those laws unless a compact provided for the transfer of jurisdiction. So um, a tribe, to do class three gaming, a tribe has to have a number of things, or for that matter, class two as well. You have to have a gaming ordinance that authorizes the forms of gaming to be conducted. You have to establish an independent tribal regulatory authority that does licensing of facilities and people and does background investigations of employees and enforces the game rules, minimum internal control standards, or as they become known, TICs, tribal internal control standards and regulations. Have to have annual independent audits. Uh, the tribe has to protect the health and safety of patrons and employees. It has to comply with applicable federal laws and if net gaming revenues are gonna be distributed per capita to tribal citizens, you have to have BIA approval of a revenue allocation or revenue distribution plan that ensures adequate funding for the tribal government. Um, and, uh, and also these ordinances are subject to NIGC review and approval, but the, the RAP, the revenue allocation plan, is subject to BIA approval. And change, jumping ahead. am I jumping oh. ahead? Oh, God. Well, we'll just skip that slide. Um, okay. So, the tribal gaming ordinance has to require that the, the uh, net revenues are not to be used for purposes other than funding the tribal government operations or programs, providing for the general welfare of the Indian tribe and its members, 
The reference to general welfare raises a whole other set of issues that are beyond today's discussion of what is and is not general welfare as opposed to a, a ruse for distributing per capita uh, without making it subject to taxation. Um, to promote tribal economic development, donating to charitable organizations, or to help fund the operation of local government agencies. So now we'll catch up. So it prohibits per capita distributions unless there is prepared a, a, a DOI approved re revenue allocation plan that protects the interests of minors and incompetents and the, re the recipients are notified that per capita payments are subject to federal income tax and per capita payments are supposed to be reported on IRS form 1099. And uh, people are getting increasingly creative in their treatment of these, uh, these payments and finding uh, creative ways to reduce the amount of taxable distributions to members. That went smoothly, okay. Um, so now we get into the compacting process. To, to do class three gaming, tribe has to request a compact of the state. The state is obligated to negotiate in good faith and um, the, the test of good faith is whether the tribe is demanding thing, excuse me, whether the, the state is demanding terms and conditions in a compact beyond those that IGRA authorizes. Remember that the purpose of IGRA primarily when it was concerning state interests was to guard against the infiltration of criminal elements and ensure the honest operation of the games, not to open the door for the state to come in and impose all kinds of state policies, even laudable state policies, but that invade the proper province of a sovereign tribal government. So here's what IGRA says a compact may include. Uh, provisions related to the application of criminal and civil laws and regulations of the tribe or the state that are directly related to and necessary for the licensing and regulation of that activity. Directly related to and necessary for licensing and regulation. The allocation of criminal and civil jurisdiction between the state and the tribe necessary for the enforcement of such laws and regulations. What laws and regulations? Those directly related to and necessary for the licensing and regulation of the activity. Uh, the assessment by the state of such activities and such amounts as are necessary to defray the costs of regulating such activity. So the state is not supposed to have to go into the hole because it creates an agency, as did California, to oversee primary tribal regulation of the gaming activity. Uh, as we'll see when we get into a discussion of the bad faith lit litigation, uh, the state is collecting way more than is reasonably needed to defray the state's regulatory costs to the point that the special distribution fund here in California has a surplus big enough to fund two, almost three years of the agency's budgeted operation and still the money continues to come in. Um, taxation by the tribe of such activity in amounts comparable to amounts assessed by the state for comparable activities. This is something that may be included, need not necessarily be included. It, it also includes uh, remedies for breach of contract, standards for the operation of such activity and the maintenance of the gaming facility, including licensing. And here's the kicker, um, subsection Romanet 7, any other subjects that are directly related to the operation of gaming activities. That catch-all could be, from the state's perspective, uh, catch everything. Um, interestingly, um, IGRA uses the term gaming activities throughout, I think 17 different times. It never defines gaming activities. And so that itself has become an issue of dispute and the Supreme Court in the, in the Bay Mills decision narrowed that def decision, that definition to what goes on in a casino, the roll of the dice, the spin of the wheel, the actual playing of the games. Um, and that, that be, has be, been a major issue in compact negotiations, particularly here in California. Um, so IGRA also says, except for any assessments that can be, may be agreed to with respect to defraying the state's regulatory costs, 
nothing in this section shall be interpreted as conferring upon a state or any of its political subdivisions authority to impose any tax, fee, charge, or other assessment upon an Indian tribe or upon any other person or entity authorized by an Indian tribe to engage in a class three activity. No state may refuse to enter into the negotiations described in paragraph 3A based on the lack of authority in such state or its political subdivisions to impose such a tax, free fee, charge, or other assessment. Okay. Okay. Keep. Okay. Next slide. No. Yeah, go to 56. There you go. Okay. So I talked a moment ago about the Michigan versus Bay Mills case. Um, we in California uh, are stuck for the moment uh, with the Ninth Circuit's decision in the case called Coyote Valley 2 that broadly interpreted any other subjects or direct, that are directly related to the operation of gaming activities. The example they used with respect particularly to the Tribal Labor Relations Ordinance was that the jobs would not exist without the gaming and the gaming couldn't be operated uh, without the workers. And so that justified in their minds the imposition of the requirement that the tribe enact a tribal labor relations ordinance uh, acceptable to the state. Um, Interior has given this catch-all provision a, a narrower meaning in a series of what we call deemed approved letters or considered approved letters that explain why no Brown or Newsom administration compacts were affirmatively approved by Interior uh, and why a couple of others were disapproved uh, due to inclusion of provisions extending beyond what DOI considered to be directly related to the operation of gaming activities. And most recently, uh, the district court in the Chicken Ranch case, which is a, a bad faith case by uh, Chicken Ranch, Blue Lake, Chimawavy, Robinson, and Hopland, um, to justify including a whole lot of issues as what the tribes contended were not proper subjects of negotiation, but which under the Coyote Valley standard, the court said were, but were so attenuated from the actual operation of the games that the, tri that the state had to offer meaningful concessions in return, had failed to do so, and therefore that the state had failed to uh, uh, negotiate in good faith. Next slide, please. Uh, next, can we go to the next slide? Yes. Um, we have in IGRA's legislative history a specific admonition against states using the compacting process to intrude deeply into tribal affairs beyond what's necessary for the proper regulation of class three gaming activities. Um, that hasn't deterred the state of California from plunging deeply into um, what should be matters of internal tribal governance and internal tribal business decisions, but um, that's gonna be hashed out, I think, by the Ninth Circuit on de in oral argument on the Chicken Ranch case on December 9th. Um, already talked about the state not being obligated to negotiate for forms of class three gaming that it does not affirmatively authorize, although it may do so. Um, and then again, a tribe can conduct class two gaming unless that gaming is affirmatively uh, prohibited by state law. The interesting thing is, that IGRA's language with respect to class two and class three is identical, but the Ninth Circuit gave it uh, a different interpretation. It said it, the same language meant one thing for class two and something else for class three. So next, next slide, okay, compacting process. So the tribe ask, has to ask the state to enter into negotiations. Um, if the tribe, if the parties agree on the terms, in California anyway, the legislature has to ratify the compact. It's submitted to the Department of the Interior, which has 45 days to review it and either approve it, disapprove it, or do nothing, in which case it is considered approved, but only to the extent consistent with IGRA and federal trust responsibilities. Uh, the compact doesn't actually take effect until it's, a notice is published in the Federal Register that it is approved or considered approved, and that process can take a couple of weeks. In most circumstances, that couple of weeks 
may not be of particular critical importance as June 30th, 22, 22 grows every ever nearer for those tribes in California that have compacts that expire on that date, um, those weeks may become of greater significance. Now, if the parties haven't agreed on a compact within 180 days after the tribe requests negotiation, the tribe has the right to go to court and sue the state, alleging that the tribe failed, the state failed to negotiate in good faith or didn't respond. Um, that works in states where the state has waived its sovereign immunity to unconsented suit. Uh, the Seminole case out of Florida held this provision of IGRA uh, did not abrogate state sovereign immunity, that Congress did not have the authority under the Indian Commerce Clause to abrogate state sovereign immunity. And therefore, in a lot of states, tribes really have had no remedy when they were stonewalled uh, by the states. And that, in large measure, triggered DOA's, DOI's policy of issuing these considered approved letters rather than leaving tribes with absolutely no way to get compacts uh, in the face of state uh, resistance. California waived its sovereign immunity in the one section of Proposition 5 in 1998 that survived the state Supreme Court's decision in HERE versus Davis, and that authorized suits against the state by tribes for failing to negotiate in good faith. Uh, next slide, please. So what happens when a tribe sues the state because it couldn't reach an agreement? If the tribe introduces evidence of either no compact uh, and the state's failure either to respond or failure to respond in good faith, the burden shifts to the state to demonstrate that it acted in good faith. And under the Rincon decision, uh, the state's subjective belief in its good faith is not enough. It has to be objectively uh, legitimate. And uh, how that plays out, one of, one of the problems that we lawyers have with these cases is because so few states have affirmatively agreed to be sued, there is not a very large body of case law uh, interpreting a lot of these things. And so we're kind of making it as we go along. So what happens if the court finds that the, the state failed to negotiate in good faith? The court issues an order directing the parties to negotiate for, for up to 60 days. Um, that has happened in the chicken ranch decision, um, most recently by Judge Ishii uh, on March 31st of this year. The state has resisted uh, participating in these negotiations. But if within that 60 days, the parties reach an agreement, that will be the compact. IGRA is silent on whether state, uh, the state legislature might have to ratify that agreement, uh, but IGRA says if you reach agreement, that becomes the compact. If not, the court appoints a mediator. Each side submits its last best offer to the mediator. The mediator picks the proposal that the mediator believes is most consistent with IGRA, sends that to the state. If the state accepts that, and the state has 60 days within which to uh, accept or reject it, that becomes the compact. If the state rejects it, then the mediator notifies the Secretary of the Interior, sends the proposed compact to the Secretary, and the Secretary, in consultation with the tribe, prescribes what are called procedures uh, for the conduct of Class Three gaming by that tribe. There are four secretarial procedures in California. Rincon, which closely tracks the 99 compact. Um, Big Lagoon, which uh, does not closely track the 99 compact. Um, North Fork and Estomumica, or Enterprise. Uh, the latter three contain many of the provisions uh, to which other tribes have objected and are the subject of these bad faith cases. Uh, but they're being used by the state as clubs saying, well, Interior put them into the procedures, so they must be OK. Um, in, in Chicken Ranch, uh, Judge Ishii found that many of the state's demands were not bad faith per se, but the state acted in bad faith by failing to offer meaningful concessions in return. Um, next slide. Uh, the last California compacts, oh, that is the one, uh, to be affirmatively approved were those 
that Governor Schwarzenegger negotiated in 2004. Um, uh, the DOI did not approve and has not approved either Brown or, or Newsom administration's uh, compacts. Uh, the, the North Fork procedures were issued after California's voters overturned the legislators, legislature's ratification of the compact. Um, and uh, Enterprise's procedures was issued after the legislature did not vote on the ratification of that tribe's compact, both of which were deemed by the courts to be acts of bad faith by the state. Now, I've already discussed the issue of the governor's authority to concur, so we will switch to the, 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 the last slide in this series. Um, the legislature just ratified three of the eight compacts that were negotiated toward the end of this last session that were replacing 99 compacts. The other five presumably will be presented to the legislature in 2022. At least 13 tribes have sued the state for failing to negotiate in good faith. There were five tribes in Chicken Ranch, as I mentioned a moment ago, and separate lawsuits filed by Bear River, uh, Bishop Paiute, Cahuilla, Calusa, Palma, uh, Pitt River, uh, Redding, and Saboba, although I understand that one of those cases uh, uh, may be dismissed if it hasn't been dismissed already. Um, in Chicken Ranch, Judge Ishii did rule for the tribes. He found that one provision in the state's proposed compact was bad faith per se, namely that requiring the tribe to honor state court child and spousal support orders uh, as being so removed and independent from the operation of gaming activities as to be uh, not a proper subject of compact negotiation. Um, as I said, the other seven issues in Chicken Ranch, the judge ruled were not bad faith per se, but the state had to offer meaningful concessions. In six, at least, of the other, well, now seven of the other pending cases, I forgot to mention, between the time I put this together and now, uh, Augustine filed his bad faith case uh, this past week. Um, it was filed last Friday and was served uh, Tuesday. Um, the, these other more recent cases raise 13 or 14 separate issues that uh, are believed not to be uh, proper subjects of negotiation. While this has been pending, as you can, if you look at a calendar, you see that June 30th, 2022 isn't very far away. The legislature is not going to be in session again till January. Um, the deadline for introducing new bills is roughly the middle of February. For a ratification bill to take effect immediately, it has to be passed by a two-thirds vote in each house of the legislature. So a lot has to happen if tribes with compacts that expire on June 30th, 2022 are to have compacts that last beyond that date. And to that end, uh, for a number of years now, a number of tribes have asked the state to agree to a simple extension of their terms of their 99 compacts, or in the case of Augustine, their 2000 compact, to allow enough time for the courts to resolve the, the outstanding legal disputes, and after those issues are resolved, to then negotiate compacts that are consistent with, the, with what the courts have said are or are not proper subjects of negotiation. The first, the first California compacts uh, were OTB, off-track wagering compacts. Uh, Glenn did the first one for Cabazon. Uh, I did one for Sequan, uh, uh, Viejas, and Barona, and San Manuel followed suit. Uh, those compacts were only a few pages long. Uh, the tribes don't do the uh, accepting of wagers. They, they Clerks employed by the Southern California Off-Track Wagering Inc. Um, took the money in and pooled the wagers with uh, the pools, the paramutual pools with the host tracks. Uh, there was one uh, big dispute, and that was whether the, the state could collect its license fee on wagers placed at uh, tribal off-track wagering facilities. And the compact specifically allowed the tribes to bring suit uh, in federal court to resolve that issue, and if the tribes lost, the state could keep the money. If the tribes won, the state had to refund the money. And it took several years, and, and I just have this vivid memory of Glenn and I just outside of Judge Levy's courtroom. Glenn 
turning to me and saying, well, George, this should be a slam dunk. <laughs> and we walked in, and Judge Levy slammed us and dunked us. Yeah. Um, and it, it took several more years of litigation, and ultimately uh, the tribes won. They got, they got a refund of the state license fee. Unfortunately, since then, uh, the state has put into the OTB compacts that have come along more recently that the state gets that license fee, so they've nullified uh, that victory. Uh, other early compacts, uh, some of them were like in Michigan where the, the, the tribe had to post a sign, I think it was three feet by two feet, saying the gaming in this facility is not regulated by the state of Michigan, talk to the FBI. Um, uh, and, then, and then we've seen, as I mentioned earlier, the Florida versus Seminole decision that took away the judicial remedy for bad faith cases in, in states where they had not waived their uh, sovereign immunity, and that has paved the way for what has happened since, uh, which is a, a trend over the last 20, 25 years of uh, the states include loading compacts up with more and more things that were never intended by Congress to be included, land use regulation, labor relations, uh, honoring state court garnishment orders, minimum wage requirements, employment discrimination, notwithstanding that tribes are excluded from the definition of employer under both the ADA and Title VII, uh, and uh, requiring negotiating binding uh, mitigation agreements with non-tribal governments, uh, payments into the state general fund, although after RINCON, the state in California isn't demanding that anymore, and other subjects that really are not related to the, op the actual operation of class three gaming. Um, the, uh, the payments to state general funds uh, in return for true tribal exclusivity began elsewhere, uh, but the, the, the trend of state encroachment really accelerated in California. Uh, first in, in the Pete, what I'll call the Pete Wilson compacts, which were so offensive to most California tribes that it triggered Proposition 5. Um, and, then, uh, and then in the 1999 Davis Compacts. And why were those things in the Davis Compacts? Because the tribes were facing the threat of imminent uh, federal shutdown. If they hadn't agreed, the legislature's session was nearing an end, and uh, had tribes not agreed to those compacts, I suspect you would not see tribal government gaming in California that looks anything like, like it does today. Um, Schwarzenegger uh, was a throwback to Pete Wilson in a lot of respects. As I was mentioning earlier before over lunch, there's something about tribes that makes these Republicans into staunch advocates for consumers, for workers, for the environment. Um, and and uh, Jerry Brown continued that trend in some ways more extremely than, than Arnold had. Um, and until now, anyway, uh, the Department of the Interior has, has taken sort of a, a hands-off attitude, um, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, because in so many states, tribes really had no recourse against a stonewalling state. The choice was either a lousy compact or no compact. Um, California is no longer in that situation. So California, uh, California compacts now limit the number of slots uh, and casinos. Uh, there are some tribes whose 99 compacts allowed 2,000 machines and two casinos, whose new compacts allow one casino and 1,600 machines. Um, there are some tribes that had unlimited machines, uh, but now have limits of 5,000 machines or 7,500 or, or even 3,500 machines, um, and really got nothing in the way of consideration for those uh, concessions. Um, the tribes are reimbursing the state for costs far beyond the state's direct regulatory costs. Uh, tribes have to adopt and comply with state or local building codes. Uh, they have to contribute to state administered funds uh, unrelated to gaming activities, such as the Tribal Nations Grant Fund. Um, and uh, have not only far more extensive environmental reviews that basically impose CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, on tribal uh, government decision making, but also uh, negotiating and, if necessary, arbitrating binding and enforceable mitigation agreements 
with local governments. Uh, and, and one of the most contentious issues, uh, the compacts since the 99 compact uh, have required tribes to agree to a unique labor relations regime that is unlike that imposed on any other California employer other than a tribe with a compact uh, that is subject to the National Labor Relations Board's jurisdiction. Recall that in 1999, the NLRB had not exercised jurisdiction over tribal casinos, and that was the main price that tribes had to pay to get a deal because of the democratic control in the legislature and, and the governor's debt to organized labor. Uh, that original TLRO was unprecedented nationally. It gave labor rights it didn't have under the National Labor Relations Act, but it also uh, preserved certain tribal governmental prerogatives and recognized tribal governments as sovereign. Uh, the new state's new TLRO strips all of that away and enables a private organization, uh, a labor union, to require a sovereign tribal government to submit to binding interest arbitration of collective bargaining impasses. Um, that's a, a major subject of dispute in, in some of the ongoing, uh, the ongoing litigation. I got too heavy, a, too heavy a finger. There we go. Okay. So the, the current compacts require creation of remedies and money damages for personal injuries to patrons and contractors, even if those injuries are unrelated to the operation of gaming activities. The Tenth Circuit has taken a different view in the Navajo Nation versus Dali case, a slip and fall in a restroom is not directly related to the operation of gaming activities. If a slot machine falls on somebody, that is. Uh, but that's the Tenth Circuit. We're in the Ninth Circuit. Um, the, uh, the new compacts require remedies, that the tribe create remedies in money damages for employment or for workplace discrimination. And that includes not only people currently working for the casino, but also people who apply for, uh, for work at a casino. Um, as I said, Congress has expressly exempted tribes from the definition of employer under the ADA and Title VII. So in our bad faith cases, we're contending that that is not a proper subject of negotiation. Um, the compacts currently at issue and all of the compacts that have led up to today uh, require tribal compliance with state court child or spousal support orders. Not that those are bad things, it's just not the state's prerogative, we think, to impose that obligation on tribal sovereign, gov sovereign governments. Judge Ishii agreed and said that was the one provision that was bad faith per se for the state to propose. Um, the state, the new compacts require the tribe to operate as the state's collection agent for uh, state income tax on the withholding of salaries uh, from the wages of, of tribal casino employees except for tribal members who are exempted by state law from having to pay state income tax on their on-reservation earnings. Um, and the current compacts extend the reach of the compact to employees of the gaming operation broadly defined that have nothing to do with the operation of gaming activities, food and beverage and that sort of thing, for example. Um, so where has Interior been in all this? Uh, basically missing in action. Uh, in 1998, it affirmably approved the, uh, the Wilson Compact, which triggered Prop 5 and then Prop 1A. Uh, it affirmatively, affirmatively approved the 99 compacts. Uh, it affirmatively approved the six Schwarzenegger Compact Amendments. Um, it affirmatively disapproved two California compacts, uh, Upper Lake and Pinoleville, uh, because they had general fund payments and the Mashpee uh, tribe uh, as well because that compact involved issues totally unrelated to gaming. I think it was hunting and fishing rights or a land claim settlement. Um, as I said earlier this morning, there were four, or this afternoon, there were four sets of California procedures, three of which include many of the provisions that DOI says are not proper, but DOI covered itself by saying don't take our agreement to these procedures as, a, uh, as endorsement of these terms in a compact. In those cases, the mediator chose the tribe's proposed compact and the tribe's proposed compact 
contain those provisions, and the tribe asked the secretary, the tribes asked the secretary to make as few changes as possible in those provisions. Why that was done, I can't speak to, because I wasn't involved. Um, so I've explained earlier why there have been such bad deals uh, from our perspective. Um, you know, the, the Rumsey decision held that the state didn't have to negotiate for forms of class three gaming that were not affirmatively authorized. Uh, we were able to hold off the, uh, the federal enforcement uh, actions by the pendency of the Rumsey litigation and then Prop 5, uh, but eventually had to accept the 99 compacts in order to avoid shutdown. Um, what are the secretarial procedures? Um, RINCON, as Scott will probably talk about, defeated the state's demand for general fund payments. Well, am I, have I crossed out? No. No. I have, oh. Okay. Whoops. Thank you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Okay. Ah, okay. Um, and, and as I said, both North Fork and Enterprise were two-part two determinations. Um, and DOI claimed to be bound by the respective mediator selections of those compacts, but cautioned that, and this next language is very important. God. It's a hair trigger on this thing. Okay. Um, we note that the procedures do not draw bright lines for future compacts. We have purposely ref refrained from changing regulatory provisions in deference to the mediator's submission to the department and the tribe's specific request that we change that, that submission as little as possible. We understand that the mediator's submission reflects compromises the tribe agreed to make rather than compromises that the tribe was required to make under IGRA. So the question is why, why those tribes made those, con uh, those compromises, uh, it's up to those tribes to explain it. Um, I can't, I, what I can say is that if the pending bad faith cases result in judgments that the state failed to respond or failed to negotiate in good faith, I suspect that the tribe's submissions of compacts to the mediator will not look nearly as much like the state's proposed compact as some of these earlier compacts did. With that, Scott, pass, pass the clicker. Pass the baton. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, uh, you know, before I get into the, the PowerPoint, I want to make a couple of uh, uh, just comments on uh, what everyone has uh, uh, witnessed this afternoon. Uh, I think this is the third time we've done this. We did it to a number of uh, staffers and uh, uh, and, uh, and legislators uh, up in Sacramento. Uh, and then uh, before the pandemic, uh, we had a session at, at, uh, at Morongo. And so this is really the third time we've gone through this. And uh, you know, as a, as a lawyer that's been involved with, with uh, representing tribes since, uh, since the uh, you know, uh, mid to late 80s, uh, uh, I can't get enough of this. Uh, uh, you. Uh, what you've witnessed here in the last couple of hours, you know, is uh, hearing it from the from the horse's mouth. You know, the you know the the true heroes uh, are are the uh, the tribal leaders uh, that had the uh, the backbone to uh, stand up and fight the fight uh, in the uh, uh, in the 1980s. Um, uh, but those fights uh, ultimately culminated in the courtroom which ultimately culminated in the Supreme Court and the Cabazon decision. And uh, these two gentlemen, you know, George joked about it, but, uh, but it wasn't the joke. They literally flipped a coin between the two of them uh, to uh, decide uh, who would argue on behalf of the tribes in Cabazon and Morongo uh, versus state of California. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, all of our lives would have been completely different if that case uh, had gone the other way. Uh, I've, uh, I've been thrilled to have a career to where I truly enjoy what I'm doing uh, and, uh, and it's, uh, uh, you know, it's attributed to those leaders that stood up and fought the fight and it's attributed to these two gentlemen who, uh, who uh, convinced the 
United States Supreme Court that the tribes were right in terms of their <laughs> right to vote. Um, I, you know, I also want to uh, um, I, you know, expand upon you know, George's concern about June 30th, 2022. You know, we are fortunate here in California that, uh, that California is one of the very few states uh, that has not waived its 11th Amendment immunity. When I get into my comments about taxation here in a few minutes, um, you know, I'm going to contrast, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we, we, you look around. I mean, we got a great facility by a, uh, operated by a great tribe as a result of what it's able to do under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Uh, the economic transformation that Indian gaming has created for Indian country uh, is unquestioned. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, historic. Um, and, uh, and, and it has truly, you know, brought tribes uh, into, uh, uh, into a completely new era in terms of not just their own governments, but intergovernmental relations. But ever since the Supreme Court found that the provision in the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act that allowed tribes to file suit against the state for failure to negotiate in good faith, Supreme Court struck that down, said that violates the state's 11th Amendment rights. The Congress did not have the constitutional authority to abrogate state sovereign 11th Amendment immunity in an action brought by a tribe um, uh, against the state and federal court. Um, and you know, that was the remedy the Congress intended, the Congress created, and that was the leverage that tribes, not just in California, but throughout the country, had in order to hold states accountable. When George put up that slide that's put down the provisions in IGRA of what the compact's supposed to be about, you know, it's, it's supposed to be about the proper regulation of gaming. There's two governments wanting to make sure that gaming is fair and properly regulated, how do we make that happen? Um, but that's not what compact negotiations are anymore. Um, uh, they haven't been since uh, the Supreme Court struck down the remedial provisions. And even here in California, where the state has waived its 11th Amendment immunity, you know, it, uh, uh, it borrows from the overreaching that states throughout the, uh, the country uh, embrace. Uh, those of you that might remember the, uh, the, the Arnold Schwarzenegger campaign, you know, he put on advertisements that says, well, Mashantucket, Pequot, and Connecticut, who agreed to 25% of their slot revenue in order to have what was the time, not just Connecticut exclusivity, but real, really northeastern United States uh, exclusivity, well, if it's good enough for the two tribes in, in the state of Connecticut, um, it's good enough for the 110 tribes in California. And, uh, and that's why he uh, set out on, uh, on an agenda to impose uh, a tax on the tribes. Uh, and, uh, and, and he almost got away with it. You know, there were a number of tribes that, uh, that um, uh, were uh, seriously limited by the 2000 machine and two location limitations in the 1999 compacts. And the only way that they were going to get more machines was to agree or capitulate to Schwarzenegger's demand of, of, uh, of 20, 25% of the revenue. Um, and uh, and uh, they signed compacts. And, uh, and uh, when Rincon said, well, we want an amendment to our compact, Schwarzenegger said, well, um, you know, I've got a dozen tribes here that have signed this 25% revenue requirement. So um, um, that's the deal, Rincon, if, that's, if you want to operate more than 2,000. Anyway, oh, I just need to back up. It wasn't just the 2,000 machine limit. The original 1999 compacts had the statewide licensing pool, and even if you even if 
even though your compact might entitled you to 2,000, you could only add an additional machine if you got it out of the pool. Well, in a whole nother set of litigation involving, uh, again, George represented uh, Calusa, um, uh, I represented Rincon, uh, you know, uh, the state had come up with this formula that said there were no licenses, no more licenses available. So even if you wanted to add additional machines within your 2,000 machine limit, you couldn't because Schwarzenegger said there were no license, no more licenses available. So the only way that you're going to get uh, the ability to add machines um, is uh, to sign his new 25% tax compact. Um, uh, Rincon would have none of it. Uh, and so they sued the, uh, the state um, for bad faith um, and, and won. It took almost a decade to get through all the various permutations of, uh, of the litigation, but Rincon does not have a compact with the state of California. It has secretarial procedures. And unlike the other set of three, the other three sets of procedures that George was talking about, um, uh, Enterprise, Big Lagoon, and North Fork, um, you know, Rincon's procedures look a whole lot like the 1999 compact um, because the tribe just, you know, uh, put its foot down and said, we're not agreeing to all this nonsense. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the court really had no problem looking at the facts saying that constitutes bad faith. Um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, and, the, and that's it. I mean, that's what, so that's why Rincon today has procedures instead of a compact. And, uh, and that's also why Rincon pays no tax to the state. Uh, in fact, even the provision in the Rincon procedures uh, regarding the payment into the special distribution fund um, is, uh, is an issue of ongoing dispute between Rincon and the state. Uh, because uh, you know, we take the position today and have taken the position all along, which is very consistent with the provision set forth in the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act that, uh, that George put up, that the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act makes it very clear that states cannot use the compact process to impose a tax upon a tribe. And, uh, and so our position today continues that we will not pay a dime uh, more than the state's actual and reasonable cost to perform its oversight responsibilities under the compact. We all get these invoices every, every quarter or every year to be broken down by quarters by the state telling us, you know, pay X amount of money. We've all demanded audits by the state to tell us, you know, where that money uh, is being spent. They still haven't provided that audit. They still, I'm sorry? It is finally being done. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, you know, well, that, that will become interesting because that's going to take this to another level because they have given us anecdotes. When they, when they litigate against Pama or Pasquenta or Shemawevi, or, or Augustine, or Bishop, or Chicken Ranch, they're taking your SDF funds to fund that litigation. Uh, a lot of that litigation, a lot of those bills, you can even look at the line items they do provide. Um, uh, uh, more than a third, slightly less than half, um, goes to problem gambling. There's nothing in the Rincon procedures that obligate the state to to, uh, to provide problem gambling programs. Uh, the tribe, you know, separately uh, funds its own. The tribe separately works with, with the gold standard of problem gambling programs with, the, with its uh, management partner and uh, in Caesars Entertainment. Uh, and, uh, and if you also, and if you look at the statistics regarding problem gambling, um, it's no greater today than it was before the advent of Proposition 5 in, uh, in Proposition 1A in the late 1990s. Yet here is almost half of that bill, you know, going, going, to, these, going to these provisions. So um, first time we got the bill, what, 12 years ago now? I don't know, it's been a long time. 
first bill, you know, we invoked dispute resolution with the state um, uh, to try to resolve it. And, uh, and um, you know, we've gone through a couple of meet and confer sessions and it doesn't, nothing happens. Um, some of these compacts that have been negotiated since then now have language so that it is clear that the state, you know, is going to do these things and have the tribes pay for them. Um, uh, Rincon uh, just stopped paying. You know, we pay, we pay that portion of the fees that we can be certain are actual and reasonable costs by the state and, uh, and told the state that we've invoked dispute resolution, we haven't resolved it. You know, if you don't think uh, that, uh, that we're right and, and uh, you think we're wrong, you know, sue us uh, because, uh, uh, because we're not paying. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I, I, I tell that because because I think it's a good anecdote to get into to where these compacts are. Um, like I said, I can't dispute the true metamorphosis that has occurred in Indian country as a result of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. But when you look at these compacts here in California, and you look at these compacts that have been negotiated throughout the United States, they have become a mechanism for state governments to intrude and impose upon tribal self-governance way beyond what Congress intended when they gave them a seat at the table in the passage of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. That legislation that, 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 uh, that, that, that Glenn was referring to at the, that was pending at the time of the uh, Supreme Court decision in Cabazon was legislation to have tribal and Department of Interior regulate tribal gaming in the Indian country. No role for the state. It was only after the Cabazon decision came down and Congress took the issue of Indian gaming seriously uh, that the states were given a seat at the table. And that seat has morphed into, into a uh, a history of overreaching into matters that go far beyond the, the actual regulation to make sure that the dice are rolled fairly, to make sure that the roulette wheel isn't, isn't cheated, to make sure that money isn't laundered through the facility. Um, it's, you know, but, but if you look at this compact, you know, in California being a great example, you know, it's the state, you know, I, 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 yeah, and, I, and candidly, I represent tribes in California that have signed, that have signed these agreements um, because I understand how difficult a decision it is because if you don't, you have, it's either sign the agreement or go into this long protracted uncertain litigation uh, with the state. And, uh, and uh, but you look at it and you have to be candid with yourself about, about you know, what it is. Um, uh, you know, and uh, and you know, and, and the governmental decisions that that go into that. You know, sure, the tribe might, as a matter of tribal self-governments, uh, embrace the same kind of water quality, food and beverage handling, environmental uh, control issues that uh, that the state has. But it should be done as a matter of tribal self-governance of the tribe deciding in its own sovereign right what to do, uh, and not what the state tells you to do. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and Governor Brown, you know, you know, bless him for a lot of the good things that he's done, but you know, you know, he comes in and says, well, um, okay, Rincon won, so I'm no longer going to uh, tax the tribes and put it into the general fund, and I'm no longer going to impose a 25% rate, but I still am gonna impose a tax on you but I'll start giving you all these credits against those tax as long as you tribe spend it on the types of programs that I, Governor Brown, like. That is that is that isn't negotiation. That's paternalism, and it's uh, and frankly, you know, it, it's uh, you know, it's it. When I look at those kinds of provisions, uh, and I look at what Congress intended in the passage of Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. They don't, they don't add up.
Um, and, uh, and so I applaud the, uh, the chicken ranches and the, and the Calusas and the Sabobas uh, of the state that are, are standing up to the, uh, the overreaching of the, of the Brown and Newsom administrations. You know, they, they're, they're a whole lot better than what Arnold Schwarzenegger tried to impose upon us, but they still fall far short of the mark of what Congress uh, intended. So, I mean, it's really clear. I mean, it, it's, that's, that's the language from, from the Indian Gaming Re Regulatory Act. Except for any assessments that may be agreed upon under paragraph C3C3 3, 3, C3 of this subsection, the assessment by the state of such activities and such amounts as are necessary to defray the cost of regulating such activity, Nothing in this section shall be interpreted as conferring upon a state or any of its political subdivisions authority to impose any tax, fee, charge, or other assessment upon an Indian tribe or upon another person or entity authorized by an Indian tribe to engage in a class three gaming activity. No state may refuse to enter into the negotiations described in paragraph 3A based upon the lack of authority in such state or its political subdivisions to impose such a tax or fee charge or other assessment. So my portion of today's presentation should be, should be really short, right? There it is in black and white. Question of taxation, there isn't any. Well, you know, uh, you know think about that every time your tribe writes a check to, uh, to the state and think about that time every, th about that every time you write, you write a check to, uh, to the county or the city. Because that's another thing in these compacts that just doesn't make sense when you look at it with the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. It was an infringement upon tribal self-governance to allow the state a seat at the table. But that's what Congress did. They have plenary authority. We accepted it. I don't see anything in the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act that says the county or city have a seat at the table. Yet these compacts now require you to reach an agreement with the county or the city uh, if you're going to do anything in terms of expanding your, uh, your, your, your gaming operation. Those fees are taxes. Those fees, if they're not for the actual assessment to defray the, the state's cost, is an illegal tax under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. So what can they do? Revenue sharing provisions and compacts in California and throughout the US require that gaming tax provisions be substantiated by providing meaningful concessions to the tribes of commensurate value beyond the state's good faith obligations in negotiating a compact. That's what the Ninth Circuit held in the Rincon versus Schwarzenegger litigation. Now most states, so, so states can't just say tough, give me the tax, although, you know, using 11th Amendment immunity, that's, that's what, they, what they do. They try to frame it as saying, well, we're giving you something we're not otherwise obligated to give you. Uh, and they do it in the form of, quote, exclusivity. Now, you know, you almost have to look at it, you know, uh, from each state. New Mexico justifies its exclusivity because only tribes can conduct gaming in New Mexico. Uh, um, wait, 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 no, well, and the six state licensed horse race tracks, the largest of which is actually owned and operated by the state and the fairgrounds in downtown Albuquerque. But tribes, you have to pay for exclusivity. You know, it, uh, um, uh, here in California, you know, uh, it's supposed to be true <laughs> that tribes and only tribes can conduct class three gaming activities, specifically slot machines and banked card games. Uh, but Yoshidehi, uh, Viejas, and Saquon just lost a decision uh, in the Ninth Circuit because the, uh, the court held that the exclusivity promised by the state cannot, does not rise to the level of limiting the state's prosecutorial discretion, and so the state gets a pass for not taking enforcement action against clearly illegal gaming activity. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I mean, one of the things that I, that I think 
you know, one of the silver linings that came out of, out of the pandemic, uh, I think for a lot of your operations is, um, you know, you, when you reopened, you saw your, your bank card game play go up, didn't you? <laughs> you, know, was, you know, probably some of you to the tune of, of, of millions of dollars since, since before because the card rooms were still shut down because of the pandemic. So the players came to your operations. Those games operated by the card rooms are banked card games. You know, when, when Glenn was talking about the poker rooms in California, he was talking about, about what the industry used to be uh, in California. It was poker. You come in and you play against other players. Well, now you go to these card rooms and you play blackjack. And, oh, it's a third-party proposition player, not the house that's taking all the winnings and paying out, and, and paying out when they lose. That's banked card games to the tune of billions of dollars that supposedly justifies the fees that you're paying under your compacts because you get exclusivity. Well, you know, uh, it doesn't seem to translate that way, does it? So, um, you know, so, so, you know, you know, they hide behind this term exclusivity to justify the fees, and then they don't really provide exclusivities after the fees are, are being paid. Now, now um, uh, you know, the other point that came out of the Rincon case is the exclusivity cannot be imposed upon the tribes. And, and that's what you're seeing in some states. They're saying, oh, well, you know, because we're giving you exclusivity, you must pay these fees when the tribes are saying, no, we're, well, you know, we're, the exclusivity is not really, not real. And once, the tri and once the tribe is paid for exclusivity, the state cannot require in good faith for the tribe to pay it yet again. And this is another one of those things that well, I'm telling you what the law is. It seems black and white, but it doesn't translate that way. Uh, every one of you that has an amended compact, you've got a whereas clause that says you're agreeing to pay these fees uh, because of the exclusivity that, uh, that, that you know, isn't something the state gives you anymore. It's something that the state constitution mandates you have. And so what the court said in Rincon is the state can't expect the tribe to pay yet again for what it has already paid. So the state cannot say, well, you still have statewide exclusivity, therefore you must pay 25% of your net to, uh, to the tribes. So the easy answer on taxation is it's illegal. The reality of the answer on taxation is that it's a huge necessary cost to doing business in California. What is permissible? Despite clear guidance regarding illegal taxation of tribal gaming revenues, it remains a contentious issue in the current compact negotiations. Again, I applaud the 13 tribes that, uh, that, that are in litigation. And I'll get to the deemed approved question here too, because because you know, this question still is not settled. The fact that you're writing those checks doesn't mean that the issue is settled. You know, there is true value to exclusivity when a state, is there a value to, to exclusivity when the state fails to take enforcement action against expanded gaming? I talked about the card rooms. Uh, you, you go to uh, the Dodger game and they, that lottery thing goes around. Uh, we have all these internet cafes. Uh, there was just an article a couple of weeks ago, you know, regarding, regarding um, you know, all these, uh, you know, black market, um, you know, gambling houses in different neighborhoods. Well, you know, you know, frankly, you know, on one level, you know, you know, that's, that, that, that's not unique to California. You've got those problems, you know, and, uh, and, and from state to state, you have various levels of enforcement against those. The problem here with California, though, is that they deliberately look the other way. You know, the card rooms are so, are so intertwined with, uh, with a number of the state legislatures, you know, that they literally have local governments that are, that are you know, addicted to that revenue stream, you know, advocating yeah, we should continue to bring in this illegal revenue from uh, from these card rooms. Um, uh, you know, the what 
uh, you know, the state, it'd be one thing if the state was saying, well, we're trying to make sure that your exclusivity is being protected, but the reality of the state is doing nothing. You know, those of you that might be be involved in discussions with the the Bureau of Gambling Control and the and the California uh, Gambling Control Commission, where over the course of the last three years, you know, they have put out very aggressive proposed changes to the regulation that, if enforced and put into effect, would probably shut down the card room industry. But they never get past the public hearing stage. They said, oh, well, look, we're doing our, our, our governmental authority by having this, this hearing to discuss this idea. And their own proposal concedes that they're aware of what the card rooms are doing currently is illegal, yet they do nothing to prevent the card rooms from operating those games. And, but that's supposedly what you're paying for when you write those checks to the state. And I talked about mandatory local agreements already. Now, the, uh, and, and, the, uh, and I talked about the uh, Brown's, Brown's billing. I'm really glad to hear that that audit is finally being done. That's just the beginning, though, because that audit is going to re reveal and prove that the state is not charging you just for defraying the cost of regulation of gaming. As George said earlier, I mean, it's got, it's got a surplus sitting there that could justify three years of it. And those very card rooms that shouldn't be operating at all, I bet that audit's gonna show that your revenue is paying for the state's regulation of those facilities. You know, it's, uh, it's you know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm sorry to rant, but I wanna keep you awake in the afternoon. <laughs> Can the state require, look, we talked about problem gambling. Um, oh, and the Tribal Nations Grant Fund and the Revenue Sharing Trust Fund, and this is an area that where when I get on it, I think some people think that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm arguing against the funds, because I'm not. You know, I understand the RSTF has been a great, uh, a great benefit, especially to the non-gaming and smaller gaming tribes. That 1.1 million a year when you've got no other real discretionary revenue, you know, can make, can make all the difference in the world. But the Revenue Sharing Trust Fund was created by the tribes when we put Prop 1A together in 1990, I mean Prop 5 together in 1997. And we moved it over into, into Prop 5 when we negotiated the, uh, the, the compacts. And it was intended to be established by and managed by and distributed by the tribes. In fact, after, the, after those compacts first went into effect, uh, um, the tribes collectively got together to hire a, uh, a, 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 a reputable accounting firm that would, that would administer the, uh, the draws of the, uh, of the machine licenses and the funds. And the state issued congratulatory letters to us saying, great on your appointments, glad to see it's happening. And six months later, they said, oh, no, 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 no. The state's got to collect that money. And the state has to administer that. It's one thing for a tribe to decide to use its revenue to help fund another tribe. It's another thing for the state to say, we're going to take that money and we're going to determine who gets it and who doesn't. And, and so I'm all for the concept of a revenue sharing trust fund. I just don't see where the role of the state belongs in that discussion at all. And it's morphed into this into this Tribal Nations Grant Fund is everything that we wanted the Revenue Sharing Trust Fund to not be. It now becomes a body, and, 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 you know, and I give credit to Brown having done it right, took a number of tribal leaders, put it on the board, makes, they make this critical decision, but it's structured in a way that it really could be anybody that the state decides is gonna make the decision of who gets that money, when and how and for what that the state doesn't belong in that discussion. That's an infringement on tribal, on tribal sovereignty, and it's certainly not grounds for taxing the tribes in their compacts. So again, 
you know, the answer should be easy. The reality is that it's very hard. You know. Now, um, the state has not done well with the Department of Interior, and this is, I'm gonna pick up on what George talked about here. Um, and, uh, and for those of you that, that might wanna get into this issue as it gets further on, Kevin Washburn wrote a, a law review article a couple of years ago uh, regarding the curious development of the deemed approved letter from the Department of Interior. But this all goes back to Seminole, uh, and, uh, and, and it's gonna come back on Seminole and litigation that's going on right now that, that, that I'm hopefully gonna spend a few minutes talking about. And uh, you know, um, the, the Department of Interior you know, is, is, is feels, you know, is almost put in between a rock and a hard place to where, where you know, they have an obligation to disapprove compacts that are inconsistent with, uh, with the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Uh, as George pointed out, they did that twice here in California with, uh, with Lower Lake and, uh, and, uh, and Pinoleville. They did it with the original Mashpee uh, Wampanoag Compact uh, with Massachusetts, uh, and they did it with the uh, Forest County Potawatomi Compact with, uh, with Wisconsin. They said, you know, in these circumstances, they go too far. But the problem that they have is if they disapprove a compact and the state hides behind 11th Amendment immunity, you're ultimately depriving the tribe of the opportunity to game at all or, or operate class three gaming at all. So, so being put in that place, you know, what do they do? So that's how they've come up with these deemed approved letters that, uh, that, uh, that to where after the 45 days has elapsed, they haven't affirmatively approved it. As a matter of law, that means upon the publication in the Federal Register, they're, they're, they go into effect. And so they issue these letters. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, I think there's at least 50 directed to the governor of California um, that says, we have these concerns about the compact. We're allowing it to go through as, as deemed effect but that does, but 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 that doesn't negate our concerns, um, and that may become critical as this as this develops because because what Congress what what IGRA says is if the compact goes into effect as deemed approved, then it's in effect to the degree it's consistent as a mat with federal law, and so if it has an illegal provision in it and it's deemed approved, you know, the, the point made by Kevin Washburn's article is that that gives the tribe standing to challenge a provision in a compact that even though, even though the tribe has signed it, it doesn't take away the tribe's ability to challenge it. It hasn't happened yet, but we may see it happen soon. Um, uh, I'm gonna go sideways into a slightly different subject because it, because it comes down to the importance of the steamed approval letter. We are seeing a tsunami going across the country uh, with the authorization of sports wagering since the Supreme Court struck down the statute a couple of years, three years ago now, that, uh, that only allowed uh, Nevada and New Jersey and the Oregon Lottery to offer sports betting. It was struck down as a violation of the 10th Amendment uh, states' rights provision. And, uh, and since then, I think it's now 29 states have authorized sports wagering. 25 of those have authorized statewide mobile sports wagering. You can do it on your phone. 19 of those have, uh, have Indian lands within their boundaries. Five of those have resolved the issue about dealing with the tribes in those states. Three of those authorize the states to offer statewide mobile gaming, but as a matter of state law under state regulation and state taxation. Only two allow it under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. One kind of did it under the radar. The Colorado compacts provided 
you know, if it's the gaming's authorized in the state, you can authorize it, you, the tribes can do it too. So when Colorado passed a statewide initiative to allow the historical gaming towns of Cripple Creek and Blackhawk and I think another one um, to uh, offer statewide mobile gaming, uh, Southern Ute and Ute Mountain said, well, you know, we're entitled to do the same and they actually launched their, uh, their apps in, uh, in June of last year in the middle of the pandemic where there were really no sports activities but they got a lot of play on, on uh, Russian table tennis. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, uh, but, but everybody's probably aware, because it's all over the news, including today's news, uh, uh, of the agreement between the uh, state of Florida and the Seminole tribe. That compact under IGRA provides that the Seminole Nation and only the Seminole Nation may offer statewide mobile sports betting throughout the state of Florida. Um, high life parlors and racetracks uh, can, uh, can, uh, can join the party, but only through agreements with the Seminole tribe. Um, uh, the uh, compact was submitted to the Department of Interior, 45 days ran, no action was taken, compact went into effect. Department issues a deemed approved letter. The deemed approved letter embraces and endorses and advocates, advocates that, that IGRA allows tribes to offer statewide mobile sports wagering. Uh, the reason it didn't affirmatively approve the compact is because it had concerns regarding the, the, uh, the state having jurisdiction over patron torts, one of the questions that, uh, that George was talking about in his presentation, and concerns that those agreements with the High Lie parlors, uh, High Lie is still allowed in Florida, I don't think it exists anywhere else, um, uh, that uh, those contracts uh, you know, must be compliant with IGRA. Net 60% net 60 of the revenue to the, to the tribes. Um, uh, primary beneficiary, sole proprietary interest. Those provisions are in IGRA. Those provisions don't exist in those three states that have done it under state law. Um, the, uh, the, that's why they did not affirmatively approve the compact. They spell it out in the deemed approved letter. Well. You might have read that just yesterday, uh, the, uh, the federal court in Tallahassee dismissed the legal challenge against that compact on standing issues. But we're not done yet. There's two lawsuits that have been filed against the Department of Interior pending in DC challenging, challenging those compacts. Uh, and of course, you can expect an appeal in the northern uh, District of Florida. Um, when you read their briefing, you know they say, "Oh, well, you know, there's uh, there's no federal endorsement of uh, of these agreements because because it's just deemed approved, not uh, not affirmatively approved." Uh, in the negotiation sessions I've had with the Brown administration and and more recently with the Newsom administration, you know you can you know the stack of deemed approved letters is this thick addressed to the governor of California, admonishing with specificity on, uh, on their provisions regarding taxation, their provisions regarding mandatory local agreements, their provisions regarding environmental uh, 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 requirements being imposed upon the tribes. Can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. And what the state says back to me, you know, and, and you know, I got, you know, you know, Anna Namark said the exact same thing that Joe Dillon did. Oh, well, those are just political letters that have no consequence. They're you know, and these and and people in Florida are saying, oh, well, you know, that 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 letter is of of no consequence. Um, you know, and when you're standing there alone, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, against the state, and you don't have an affirmative approval, you know, that argument might make some sense, but the opponents to the Florida Compact sued the Department of Interior, which now means the Department of Justice is going to have to defend the Department of Interior. Glenn made an accurate point that I think is still true today, that when he was talking about 
you know, there was no brief by the United States in the Cabazon analysis, and, and that was good because there was this division of thought between folks over at Interior and folks over at the Department of Justice. Um, uh, I think that was true in 1987. I think that's also true in 2021. In fact, you know, one of my biggest frustrations with dealing with, uh, with, with, uh, with folks at Justice is I think they have the attorney-client relationship with the Department of Interior backwards. Um, uh, uh, the, um, but, uh, you know, they seem to take a different tack when they get sued. And so when these, when these card rooms in Southern Florida sued the Department of Interior in DC over the approval of the Florida Compact, you know, they are now gonna have to, to you know, make a critical decision. Are they going to defend the, the position set forth in that deemed approval letter for, uh, for the Seminoles uh, or not? Um, you know, right now all the, lit the briefing is dealing with, you know, you know, do the plaintiffs have standing? Uh, is the tribe a necessary and indispensable party? They're not really getting to the merits. But the indications are the Department of Justice is going to defend the position already embraced by the Department of Interior. The Department of Interior deliberately got out ahead of the Department of Justice in issuing that letter. And so, you know, any of you that are looking at the sports betting issue should look at that deemed approved letter because it tells you quite clearly what the position of the Department of Interior is regarding the right of the tribe to engage in sports wagering, including statewide mobile sports wagering under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. The argument that's out there is, uh, is that uh, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act doesn't allow tribes to engage in statewide mobile wagering. So it's gonna become, it's not, it's not at issue in California yet, but it's a question of when not a question of if. And, uh, and, and, uh, you know, and, and I'll get back to the main topic here, but, but, but be aware that this DraftKings proposal that's out there, that they tout as, oh, we're you know, protecting and advancing tribal interests because only tribes can operate statewide mobile wagering under their measure. It's under state law off of Indian lands, has nothing to do with IGRA, so it means no 60% net revenue guarantee, no sole proprietary interest requirement, no primary beneficiary requirement. Uh, and uh, and uh, it allows operators like DraftKings to pick and choose amongst 110 California tribes. Now, you know, that model, you know, exists in other states. Connecticut, there's three operators. Pequots, Mohegans, and the Connecticut Lottery. Uh, in, uh, in Arizona, uh, well, there's, what, 22 tribes, but 10 of them get licenses. And, oh, there's 10 professional sports franchises, so there's 10 professional sports franchises licenses too, but still only 20. In Michigan, well, there's 23. There, there's, wait, 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 no, 18. There's 15 tribes, and there's three Detroit operators. California, there's 110 tribes. So that means if it's DraftKings or FanDuel's or, or BetMGM, you know, they're, they're going to say, well, we're not interested in the 60-40 split that IGRA requires, uh, and, uh, and we're not even interested in the 10 or 15 percent that, that uh, appears to be, you know, the, the, the industry standard in, in Michigan and Arizona. Oh, no, you know, we'll, we'll find, you know, the uh, you know, the, the tribe down the road that's willing to take 5% or 0.5%. It is a model designed to enable the operators to fleece the tribes to where the vast majority of the revenue will never show up in the tribal treasuries. And, uh, and that is why defending the deemed approved letter in Seminole is not important just to Seminole, but important to every tribe in every state, including all the tribes in California. Anyway, uh, sorry for, for my sidebar, but I had to get that out. <laughs> um, uh, 
Um, but coming back to the tax provision, you know, because the other side of that Florida compact is a guaranteed $500 million a year to the state of Florida. That's a big number. Seminole's a big operation, but that's a big number. But it's true exclusivity. Nobody in the state of Florida can operate statewide mobile sports betting except for the Seminole tribe. Now, we can talk later about you know, what impact that has on Miccosukee, but that's a conversation for, for another day. There's two federally recognized tribes in, in Florida. Miccosukee does most of their stuff under the radar, still don't have a compact fee for any kind of class three gaming with the state and operate a successful class two facility about you know, 50 miles uh, um, west, of, uh, west of Miami. Um, the, uh, so I'm using what's going on in Florida to highlight these issues because they really become a very current modern day example of, of you know, you know, what is a justifiable tax on tribes and how can it be legal and how do these deemed approved letters from the Department of Interior come into play in the legal analysis and defending, on, defending what's going on. Um, now, um, the state has not done well lit in litigation. This is really mostly repeating, I think, what things that George has already covered um, the state has a very poor track record in California, and uh, thank goodness that we have the 11th Amendment waiver. And there's a backstory there, too, that a lot of people uh, uh, forget. You know, you know, the tribes put Prop 5 on the ballot in 1997. Before the ink was dry, um, HERE, the labor union, and, and with a consortium with some card rooms, filed a legal challenge directly in the state Supreme Court and struck Prop 5 down because of the constitutional language at the time that said California may not authorize any casino the type of which you find in Nevada and New Jersey. That's why we had to go back to the people in, uh, in 1999 with Prop 1A, which was a constitutional referendum, while Prop 5 in 1997 was a, a statutory or, a, or you know, it, it, we, we were trying to create it by statute, not by an amendment to the Constitution. California Supreme Court struck Prop 5 down in its entirety with the exception of one sentence, which allowed a tribe to sue a state uh, um, for the state to waive its 11th Amendment immunity in any action bought, brought, brought by a tribe for failure to negotiate a compact in good faith under IGRA. That's why the vast majority of case law that exists in the entire country on what constitutes bad faith uh, uh, negotiations uh, is, is coming out of California it's because all these other states cowardly hide behind 11th Amendment immunity. Um, I spoke about Rincon, uh, Big Lagoon, uh, you know, Big Lagoon I really liked because they won at every level and it, for a different reason on every level. Uh, uh, in the first district court proceeding, um, it, they basically piggybacked on Rincon, said you're trying to impose the same kind of tax at Rincon. The court said, well, that, that constitutes uh, uh, bad faith. Um, and then they, uh, and, then, and then the state said, Oh well, Big Lagoon, you're not really a tribe, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 they actually got a Ninth Circuit panel to to affirm that that decision. Um, and fortunately, that went up on a uh, rehearing on Bank, where they said, "No, that's 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 nonsense. They've got a a, a a federal relationship." And then in the third stage, when they got to the mediator. You know, the, uh, the state backed up off, off the taxation issue, but they overreached on the environmental issues and actually tried to impose the California Coastal Commission upon the big Lagoon Rancheria and anything they wanted to do. They lost, the state lost at every one of those three stages. Um, uh, I mentioned Calusa earlier uh, regarding the number of devices. The state, the tribes won there. Uh, 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 Palma. Well, there's a difference between Palma One and Palma Two. Um, uh, the um, in the first, in Palma's first one was 
got, they got out of the tax that they agreed to with Schwarzenegger um, under the theory that there was a mutual mistake of fact as to whether there were licenses available in the statewide pool, and that's why the state had to return tens of millions of dollars to, uh, to PAMA. Uh, but then they turned around and said, well, we don't want to sign the new compact, but we want an extension. Um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, PAMA too is a good, a good lesson in what not to do in the negotiation process because they said, oh, well, we want, an, we want a live racetrack amendment, um, and then they walked away. And the court said, you know, you gotta go, you, you, know, you can't just walk away from the table. And the state said, we're still at the table. And so the court said, well, then there's not bad faith. Um, uh, so, so Palma lost the last round. Uh, and Shima Webby filed a lawsuit, lawsuit saying that the state can't impose any kind of term limit uh, on a tribe uh, uh, in a compact uh, and lost that. But every other case, including the most recent decision out of Judge Ishii involving the chicken ranch. Uh, there's five tribes involved in the chicken ranch uh, 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 litigation. Um, uh, the tribes have prevailed. I should mention Fort Independence uh, also lost a bad faith case there. And there's a good practice pointer there too because uh, Fort Independence is a tribe that, that you know, they're, you know they, they, they're very small and very remote up in the, uh, in the high desert uh, um, uh, south of Bishop. And, um, and so they put on the table, said, okay, Arnold, um, uh, you know, if we ever make, and I can't remember what level it was, if we ever make $300 million a year uh, in, uh, in revenue, then we'll pay you what you're asking for. But until we reach that point, we're not gonna pay. And, uh, and then they sued the state, and the judge said, well, since you've agreed that there are circumstances where that tax would be acceptable, I can't find that the state uh, negotiated in, uh, in bad faith. Um, but with, with those exceptions, the tribes have, uh, have won in, 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 in every one. Um, uh, I've talked about 11th Amendment immunity. Um, I want to get to, uh, 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 well, actually, I'm just going to put that down again. I want to pick up on a, on a comment that, that uh, Glenn made, and, um, and we probably would have prepared slides for this uh, if we had known that uh, the Supreme Court was going to grant cert in the Isleta de Sur, del Sur uh, Pueblo litigation. Um, uh, all eyes are going to have to be on that litigation. I think that you know, enough things have settled since Cabazon uh, that, uh, that there's not that much risk of disruption, but some of these fundamental tenets are gonna come, come to play. The, the question presented uh, in, the, uh, in the cert position uh, is, uh, is this. Uh, uh, whether the Restoration Act, and I'll get to that in a minute, provides the Pueblo with sovereign authority to regulate non-prohibited gaming activities on its lands, including bingo, is set forth in the plain language of section 107B of the Act's legislative history, and this court's holding in California versus Cabazon Band of Mission Indians, or whether the Fifth Circuit's decision affirming this letter one correctly subjects the Pueblo to all Texas gaming regulations. Um, as, as Glenn mentioned, there were three tribes uh, uh, that uh, uh, that all had different, you know, the, there's a unique Texas history there to where instead of them being terminated, the trust responsibility was turned over from the federal government to the state of Texas, and the state of Texas was deplorable in the way they handled their trust responsibility to the tribes, which led to, to legislation to get them restored. The traditional Kickapoo tribe of Texas was the first one out of the box, I think like in 86. So their Restoration Act didn't even address gaming. To this day, uh, the Kickapoo under IGRA offer a very successful class two gaming facility near the uh, Mexican border. Um, the other two tribes, Alabama, Cachada, and Isleta del Sur, Tigua, Pueblo tribe, um, 
uh, were restored in a statute that was passed in 1987. After the Supreme Court decision came down, but before the passage of IGRA. And you had the treasurer there that said, oh my God, you can't you know, restore the tribe because they'll be able to conduct gaming under Cabazon. So their restoration statute, again, this is before the passage of IGRA, the restoration statute says, well, the tribe can't offer any game that's prohibited by the state of Texas, but the state shall not regulate the tribe's gaming. That sound familiar? It's the, it's the civil regulatory criminal prohibitory uh, dichotomy that, uh, that Glenn you know, laid out you know, in, in, in his presentation. Um, uh, the, for years, the two Texas tribes lost at every level. I can't say that. Originally, Tigwell won a bad faith case under IGRA against the state of Texas, but the Fifth Circuit said, oh, you're not under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. You're under your Restoration Act, which, which is different, and your Restoration Act says you're going to abide by Texas law. Well, both tribes have ever since said, well, wait a minute. If we're not under IGRA, we're still entitled to game because Texas has a civil regulatory regime regarding gaming in the state of Texas. State of Texas lottery is probably second only to Oregon in terms of being the most liberal lottery you know, in, the, uh, in the country. Um, uh, in the last few years, you've seen some, some cracks into that shield. You had the, uh, the National Indian Gaming Commission with a, a legal opinion from the solicitor at Interior um, uh, approve a class two only uh, gaming ordinance. Texas said, no, it doesn't mean anything to us, and the court, court agreed. But more recently, the district court in East Texas with the Alabama Cushata tribe said, well, wait a minute, you have a civil regulatory scheme, therefore the tribe is, offered, is able to offer the same games that the state has under its own regulatory regime and not the state's. Um, I was, because of that decision, I was really surprised that the Supreme Court granted cert with the, with the, uh, with the Tigua uh, petition um, because, because you, that case, if it stands, you know, could probably moot the issue in Texas, but the Supreme Court is now, has now, uh, now granted cert. In, in, uh, in 2000, the Fifth Circuit said um, the tribes aren't under IGRA. Uh, the Texas tribes are not, or the two Texas tribes. Uh, uh, Kickapoo is, Alabama, Cushada, and Tigua are not. Um, uh, I think that decision is going to come into play, but it'll be interesting to see how this plays out because it really goes back to the same Bryant versus Atasca analysis that Glenn was talking about uh, in his presentation that was uh, at the heart of the, uh, of the uh, dispute in front of the Supreme Court in Cabazon. Um, the, fact that the, the fact that this Supreme Court is gonna take a fresh look at those issues is not something that gives me comfort. I don't think it should give any of us comfort and we're gonna have to watch closely and just like 66 tribes submitted amicus briefs in support of Cabazon and Morongo, I would hope that a number of the tribes in this room would sign on to amicus briefs in support of Tigua and, uh, and Alabama Cushata. Um, uh, the, um, uh, I know it's getting late in the day. Those are really the cases that, that, uh, that, are, that are currently you know, hot and heavy that I wanted to make sure that you're aware of. Um, uh, I've got to, uh, you know, spend a, a minute letting you know that uh, that Rincon and and uh, uh, San Inez Shumash are in litigation in state court trying to shut down the illegal card rooms, but we're running into big problems there where the uh, where the uh, uh, Superior Court judge has found that uh, tribes don't have standing to bring unfair trade practices and public nuisance claims uh, against, uh, against, uh, against entities in California because they're not persons uh, uh, under California law. An outrageous result 
uh, we're in the uh, Court of Appeals now. We had an oral argument last week. It did not go well. Um, uh, but, uh, um, uh, but that's a piece of litigation to watch as well. Um, so with that, if you guys have closing comments or we want to open it up to any questions.